I, I would like first to welcome everyone to today's event. Good morning, good afternoon. We have participants from all over Canada, from all over Europe. So it great, it's great to have you with us today to the uh, CETA event, where are we more than uh, three years. Uh, my name is Tina Vizu Milusevic. I'm a professor in the Institute of uh, European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at Carlton University. Um, and uh, together with my colleague, Professor Patrick Leblon from University of Ottawa, will be moderating this uh, workshop today. Um, I would like to, uh, to mention that uh, this event is organized by the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at Caltor University, um, it, together with the CN Paul Tellier uh, Chair on Business and Policy from University of Ottawa. And uh, it is part of the Faculty of Public of, uh, Affairs Research Series here at Caltor University. Um, as you probably have already seen the, the program, we have a number of experts, um, academics, policymakers, business uh, people that will uh, provide an informed discussion about uh, CETA, practical implication, challenges, uh, successes, and so on. Um, without uh, keeping you for uh, long, uh, I would uh, like to introduce the Dean of Public uh, Affairs, the Faculty of Public Affairs at Carlton University, Brenda O'Neill, uh, for welcoming remarks and, and introduction of the uh, first speaker. Um, Dr. O'Neill was appointed as the Dean of uh, Faculty of Public Affairs on October 1st, 2020. Not the uh, you know not a, the best period, <laughs> and uh, we 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 all felt for her joining the university in such tough times. Um, uh, she also holds a, a position as professor in the Department of Political Science, and her research addresses uh, several uh, topics, including political behavior and gender and politics, largely focusing on Canada. So, Dr. O'Neill. Uh, the floor Thank is you. yours. <laughs> and thanks very much, Professor Viju. Uh, uh, first thing I want to do is thank uh, both you and the members of your team for all your work in bringing this important event together. And that includes uh, Patrick LeBon, the Associate Professor, and CM Paul L. Tellier, Chair on Business and Public Policy at the University of Ottawa. Uh, Kathleen Schmidt, who's the Project Manager, also Joan debard Levin and Akim Hurlman, who are the co-directors of the Center for European Studies. Uh, and Liliana Topchekova, the MA student in the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. So thanks all for your work. I want to welcome everyone who's joining us this morning, and that includes faculty and students, uh, government, business, and legal representatives, ambassadors, and diplomatic staff. Uh, and a very special welcome to our keynote speaker, Her Excellency Eilish Campbell, Canada's ambassador designate to the European Union at Global Affairs Canada. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge that Carleton University is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. Although we may unlikely are attending from various locations outside of Ottawa, I think it nevertheless remains important that we recognize the traditional Indigenous lands on which we reside and to do so with intention. This event is part of the FPA research series, which is an ongoing celebration of the diversity and strength of research produced in the Faculty of Public Affairs. You can visit carlton.ca slash FPA slash events if you want to learn more about the upcoming events in the series. This series supports the mission of the Faculty of Public Affairs, which is to help build better societies and stronger democracies, to address regional and global challenges, and to enhance and inform public discussion. So one of my pleasures this morning is to be able to introduce Her Excellency Eilish Campbell, the Ambassador Designate of Canada to the European Union. Dr. Campbell leads diplomatic representation to the European Union and strategic engagement of Canada's second largest trade and investment partner. She joined Foreign Affairs and International Trade Canada in 2002 as a trade negotiator in the World Trade Organization's Doha Round. She's held senior executive roles in economic, finance, and international policy, including at the Privy Council Office and Industry Canada. Dr. Campbell was also Vice President, International and Fiscal Policy at the Business Council of Canada, and served as General Director, Economic Development and Corporate Finance at Finance Canada. In this role, she led work on innovation, 
clean technology, and defense. She also served as Chief Trade Commissioner of Canada and as Assistant Deputy Minister, leading a Global Affairs Canada team of trade commissioners across six Canadian offices and over 150 locations worldwide. A range of new digital services to small business was established under her lead to promote the use of Canada's global network of free trade agreements. Dr. Campbell received her PhD in international relations from the University of Oxford. Recently in August, 2020, she earned an ICDD designation from the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. She's also designated a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. So it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Campbell this morning, and we look forward to your address. Thank you so much. Before I begin, I'll just check that you can hear me all the way from Brussels in my home office. Are we good? Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Brenda and Karina. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you. And if you don't mind me saying, I even got dressed up for the occasion. High heels and a dress, even though we're virtual, and it's a thrill to see everyone here this morning. And, and it's such a pleasure to reconnect with everyone back home. We all miss you very much, but trust me, we're working really hard for you here and we're gonna to continue to do so. Um, it's also great to see uh, Geneviève Gougion, the Deputy Director at Global Affairs Canada for the Free Trade Agreement Promotion Division, a big hi to you and the team uh, with Cindy Ev and others. I'd also like to recognize Her Excellency, Melita Gabrick, the ambassador designate of the European Union to Canada, who will also be speaking today. And Melita is not only a fantastic ambassador and representative, but she's also become a very good friend. And the entire team that she has working hard uh, for the European Union in Ottawa and across Canada is a demonstration, I believe, of the ongoing strength and commitment of our relationship. I also just really want to quickly say thank you to an incredible team that's been working so hard this week as we continue to assure the stability of supply of vaccines from the European Union back to Canada. They also helped me draft this speech. So huge thanks to Stéphane Lambert, Mary Lou Denis, and Ruben S. who have just been a tremendous uh, help this week. I've been really looking forward to this discussion. Uh, again, Krina and Patrick and the whole team, thanks for inviting me. It's a really important moment to take stock of where we've come in three and a half years and how we're going to continue to increase not only our trade, but all the economic, social, academic, research, and other relationships that make this an incredible relationship, not just now and in the future. And you'll allow me, as I'll talk about in my speech, no bigger stress test to this relationship could have occurred in the last one year. We're coming up uh, already on our one year anniversary, which I remember uh, vividly of going into our uh, global sourcing and uh, research on PPE. That's now, of course, extended into innovative therapeutics and products to combat COVID-19. So it, it's just a signal of, of how resilient and strong this relationship is that I feel we're able to present to you some of the data concerning CETA. And I think it's also important that we notice the world joins forces to fight the COVID-19 pandemic and save lives. Canada and the EU will continue to be at the heart not only of a strong bilateral relationship, a strong transatlantic relationship that includes our partners in the United Kingdom and the United States of America and Mexico, but also a global effort, uh, including on the COVAX facility and support to get vaccines to the developing world. And this week, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau spoke again with the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and they together, the Prime Minister and the President of the European Commission, agreed on the continued importance of rolling out safe and effective vaccines as quickly as possible, expanding production, and continuing our strong R&D and innovation partnership uh, between Canada and the EU. Again, COVID-19 has highlighted the interconnected nature of our economies and by extension, the importance of our strong ties across all sectors of society. That's why the Canada-European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, or CETA, 
will be more important than ever in advancing our shared and global prosperity and economic recovery from COVID-19. CETA, of course, also exists alongside a very strong strategic partnership agreement, which has a series of relationships and dialogues that cross a huge number of policy, geographically oriented, thematic, finance, development, and many other dialogues. And this shows the richness, the policy ambition, and the depth of our relationship. So my first key point to you this morning as we focus now in on CETA uh, is that it has led, of course, to an impressive expansion of our trade. And as I like to say, you know, the proof is in the results. The, the results prove out the tireless work of negotiators and the input of stakeholders to create a truly progressive, comprehensive, and dare I say it, probably uh, the best trade agreement on the planet when it comes to covering so many facets of our relationship. We've had an annual growth rate of bilateral trade that's almost doubled from that seen in the, 19, in the 2010s pre-CETA. Exports are now higher than before CETA, despite the impacts of the global pandemic. Most importantly, perhaps, the expansion has been broad-based and it's been inclusive. More Canadian small businesses are now exporting to the EU than they were before this trade agreement came into effect. They're also doing business with a greater number of EU small businesses and exporting to more member states. So right before the pandemic, close to 8,300 Canadian merchandise exporters were active in the EU market and Gosh, I only wish I had the numbers of services exporters and e-commerce exporters. So this is a little plug to any friends we have on the line from StatsCan uh, and, and the European Commission, which also has an excellent statistics services uh, uh, database that we can maybe even dig into these numbers and get you more numbers. But the ones I'm quoting are on merchandise exporters. And that number of 8,300 merchandise exporters um, is more than 500 firms greater than compared to 2016. Now imagine if we knew how many e-commerce companies we, we also had uh, and make sure that that incredible growth enabled by Shopify and others is also included in our data. Also nearly 49,000 EU firms imported from Canada representing an increase of 5% compared to 2016. Nine of Canada's 13 provinces and territories have increased their exports to the EU and our exports rose in almost all sectors and in almost all member states, again, from across Canada. Four Canadian export sectors registered particularly impressive and rapid growth. Mineral fuels and oils up 161%, aluminum and associated aluminum products up 161%, motor vehicles and parts up 52%, of course, also very much uh, aligned and integrated into the emerging electrical, uh, electric vehicle supply chain uh, crossing North America and Europe, up 52%, as I said, and mineral ores up nearly 40%. Those are some incredible numbers. And although it was a slow start for the agriculture sector under CETA, and I continue to dialogue very closely and carefully with Canada's agricultural stakeholders uh, and also seafood exporters, We've seen some really solid growth in 2020 with an increase in agri-food and seafood exports to the EU 27 of 34.5% in 2020 compared to 2019. This is also, of course, an import story. Trade is always win-win. The value of goods we import from the majority of EU member states has increased. EU products also represent an increased share of Canada's total imports growing from 9.9% in 2016 to 11.3% in 2019. This offers consumers and businesses a greater variety of goods and inputs at lower prices, also great choice thanks to the elimination of tariffs. The top five imports from the EU also rose since the implementation of CETA. Machinery, their top sector, led all products and expanded almost 30% or almost 4 billion Canadian dollars in imports of motor vehicles and parts, as well as pharmaceutical products also posted strong growth and we'll be proud to report the EU originating vaccines in those numbers for 2021. Companies on both sides of the Atlantic have increasingly taken advantage of pre preferential tariff rates 
Recent data shows that the level of utilization of the, that rate, so in other words, if you showed up and just took the off the shelf MFN most favored nation rate, that's, that's one thing, but CETA creates a preferential rate and data shows that the use, the utilization rate of that preferential rate continues to improve both for Canadian businesses and EU businesses and will continue to improve as the CETA tariff phase outs continue. So the utilization rate of CETA preferences of merchandise exports increased steadily from 52% in 2018, 54 in 2019, and now 57% in 2020. And on the EU side from 38% in 2018 to 55% in 2020. So that shows the message is getting out, right? About CETA and companies are using those rates. And it's our mission to make sure that all those rates are used by companies of all sizes from large to micro businesses. A sign that CETA has had an impact in spurring trade creation um, also comes when we look at the trade of products that experienced a tariff reduction. So for those products that had a, a tariff reduction, there was really strong growth of 18.4% in 2019 compared to 2016. Three and a half years uh, is of course still a relatively short time, right? And I'm really looking forward to continuing to keep up uh, our focus on these numbers as we get out to five and 10 years uh, of existence of this agreement. Um, you know, it's still really significant, again, that we've seen an increase in trade on both sides and across nearly all sectors. And this points to the creation of really durable business links and new supply and demand relationships between the EU and Canada. And it's significant that these have resisted and to some extent been a cushion against an even greater impact during COVID-19 on our economies. There's no doubt our businesses have suffered during the last year, and I take note particularly about the disproportionate impact on SMEs, women, and other vulnerable groups. Nonetheless, it's quite noticeable that our bilateral merchandise trade was still close to 15% higher in 2020 than in 2016. So these are Canadian exports to the EU that remained truly re resilient even in the face of an overall macro decline of about 12 and a half percent. This protected our export sector from an even more dramatic decline this year. In fact, Canadian merchandise exports to the EU grew uh, by almost 22% in 2020, when you compare that number to 2016. And this was deeply supported by an increase in agricultural products, including oil seeds and wheat, chemicals and pharmaceutical products. And this exceptional performance is notable when compared again to um, the overall decrease in trade, but on our merchandise side, uh, we saw globally only a small increase of something like 2% uh, in 2020. So you, you look at global trade overall shrinking, Canada's overall merchandise trade relatively flat, but to the EU, uh, particularly based in oil seeds and wheat, a really strong growth showing our value added as a food security partner to the European Union. Um, I would also like to highlight that during the pandemic, our R&D relationship has only become more important. And the, the startup and growth companies now today are hopefully uh, a pool of what will be much larger companies in the future. Canadian EU companies have undertaken a large number of successful research and innovation projects related to COVID-19 countermeasures, such as on vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. And about 10% of the projects approved under Canada's 54.2 million novel coronavirus rapid research funding opportunity involve EU participation. As our businesses face the difficult prospect of economic recovery, CETA will continue to help them feel protected thanks to investor confidence, stability, and predictability. The next point I'd like to develop is really about the future. So CETA will be a strong asset ensuring our economies recover from COVID. And I wanna talk a little bit about how we build back better together. Growing concerns of climate change in both Canada and the EU have already given rise to strong trade in environmental goods. Total bilateral trade in environmental goods grew 17.9% from 8.9 billion in 2016 to 10.5 billion in 2019. 
and Canadian exports of environmental goods reached 2.4 billion in 2019, up 24.7% over three years. And similarly, EU exports of environmental goods grew 16% over that same period, 2016 to 2019. Looking ahead, growth opportunities for our companies are strong and significant because like the EU, Canada will take action to continue to protect the environment and combat climate change. And like the EU, Canada has committed to putting the country on a path towards net zero emissions by 2050. To achieve this, Canada has a range of climate measures in place, including putting an economy-wide price on carbon pollution, which the Supreme Court of Canada confirmed yesterday. Currently, our economy-wide benchmark carbon price is set at $30 a ton, Canadian, rising to $170 a ton in 2030, while continuing to provide support <clears throat> to Canadians and businesses to ensure their competitiveness. Recently, the EU announced it will be looking at establishing a border carbon adjustment mechanism. Sometimes, and gosh, the, the trade world is sure full of acronyms, and this is one of them, CBAM. So if you ever hear that acronym, CBAM, it's referring to Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. And Canada, too, is exploring the potential of a CBAM and is working with like-minded economies, including the EU and with North American partners, to consider how such an approach could fit into our broader climate strategy. We have the resources, the innovations, and the know-how to offer the EU to help both of our economies and societies meet, meet our climate ambitions as part of the Green Deal. So nothing about combating COVID and nothing about the much needed economic recovery means that we will compromise on our climate objectives. It's also well known uh, that we're the fourth largest oil producer in the world. Perhaps less well known is that our vast supplies of bitumen are equally suited for producing carbon fiber for strong, light weighting materials used for manufacturing electric vehicles. Canada also generates more renewable e electricity than any other country on the planet other than China, which creates opportunities for Canadian companies to be a leader in all renewable electricity production and particularly clean hydro. Uh, we also have bio-based natural resources, the waste residues of which are ideal feedstock for renewable jet fuels. So this is the way in which we're going to combine our deep strengths as a resource economy with our climate change objectives. Uh, we're going to continue to work together on electric vehicles. We take a mines to mobility approach, which Natural Resources Canada and Environment and Climate Change Canada continue to elaborate on that takes us from mineral extraction and processing all the way to battery components and electrical vehicle production. So we continue to be a strong partner as we look towards zero emission vehicles becoming the standard across Canada and the EU. Canada is also recognized as a global leader in green building. And I think all of this together means we can see the opportunities that CETA helps provide as a solid platform for growth and as a platform for our climate change objectives and the exchange of innovative new products that help us baseline, improve, and reach our climate change objectives. We have an opportunity now to demonstrate our shared commitment to international recovery efforts and the UN Sustainable Development Goals to ensure a safer, better future for our children and grandchildren. This brings me to the final section of my address today, which is really about how we each need to take action in order to cultivate our Canada-EU relationship. Again, as I noted earlier, we have a very rich institutional framework. That's CETA, our Strategic Partnership Agreement, and our Bilateral Science and Technology Agreement, turning 25 years old this year, provide across society and the economy. We now have over 50 committees, dialogues, and working groups I mean, I'm also just showing how amazing my team is. This is what we facilitate every day to help those groups continue the strong and deep partnership between the EU and Canada, to oversee the performance of CETA, and to facilitate partnership between businesses, researchers, and academics to develop further new areas of collaboration with exciting areas like our global partnership in artificial intelligence. The active involvement of industry, academia, and civil society through CETA's domestic advisory groups 
and the Civil Society Forum has played an important role in CETA implementation. The last meeting of the Civil Society Forum took place virtually on December 8th and 9th, 2020, with more than 100 leaders from all sectors and including Indigenous leaders, youth ambassadors from across Canada and Europe. The work of civil society and academia has been particularly important for spurring ideas for cooperation in the areas of labor, environment, and sustainable development. And I just take note of Dean Brenda O'Neill's uh, fantastic opening and introduction uh, and her welcome on the traditional territories. And I would highlight that Minister Ng, uh, the, the Trade Commissioner Service, Global Affairs Canada, and myself as a Canadian uh, are all deeply committed to the truth and reconciliation calls for action. And we will continue to integrate in particular services to indigenous exporters in all of our work. Now, yesterday, Canada's Minister of Small Business and International Trade and Export Promotion, of course, uh, Minister Ng met yesterday with her EU counterpart, Executive Vice President and Commissioner for Trade, Dombrovskis, for the second CETA Joint Committee. It was a great opportunity to oversee progress in CETA, take stock of how SMEs are using the agreement, and of course, continuing to facilitate technical work across committees. There are some real improvements that have uh, occurred because of our strong committee work. Decisions, for example, bringing even more consistency and transparency to the provisions of CETA's investment chapter, the start of negotiations for mutual recognition agreement for architects. And when this is concluded, I believe it will be the first professional mutual recognition agreement that the EU has concluded, and the development of a Canada-EU strategic partnership on raw materials. So we will keep building and we will keep working in these joint committees to ensure our increased trade continues to be sustainable and benefits all Canadians. I'd also take note, of course, that Canada and the EU continue to collaborate in areas of trade and gender and climate action and I think these are particular areas that uh, Canada is championing for further uh, deepening and development uh, through the continuous modernization of CETA, much as we continue to modernize all of our free trade agreements and our instruments. Again, I also think it's important we get business involved. This doesn't work unless firms, companies, innovators, entrepreneurs feel that they are included. I'll take note of our clean tech workshop coming up on March 29th and 30th. And this will bring together clean tech innovators, users, and industry associations and government representatives to explore clean tech opportunities that are enabled through CETA. What's more, at yesterday's joint committee, the two ministers called for further action to take full advantage of the opportunity CETA offers in strengthening transatlantic cooperation on our transition to a green economy. And we are going to continue, as I say, to tackle major issues through our dialogues, such as climate change. So although the world has changed significantly in the last year, the bottom line for us is that our two-way relationship remains incredibly strong, topping more than $164 billion last year. CETA provides the certainty, stability, and protection enshrined in a rules-based system that also allows access to markets that we both need to thrive and recover from COVID. Again, the message is that everyone is included in this project and we can't leave anyone behind. So continued outreach, particularly to women, to Indigenous peoples, to young people and new Canadians, and through new forms of export, and particularly e-commerce, remain essential. We need to not only provide the right agreement, but the right tools and services. And I'd like to take note that we are taking a strong Team Canada approach under the umbrella of Minister Ng's portfolio across the Trade Commissioner Service, the Export Development Bank, Export Development Canada, the Small Business Bank of Canada, BDC, the Business Development Bank, of course, and the Canadian Commercial Corporation and Invest in Canada to promote Canadian opportunities and get SMEs, startups, entrepreneurs and growth companies, the financing and services they need in order to export not only to the EU, but to the world. And my colleague Geneviève will provide some examples of the tools we have in our toolkit. And also we remain open constantly to your suggestions of areas where we can improve both our information, our data, how we present to businesses. And of course, my favorite question, tell me who we're not reaching 
or who we might be reaching but who's not yet convinced and the kind of information that they need in order to understand that CETA is also their agreement. So thanks to all of you for joining and for your support in strengthening the bonds that keep our two societies strong. We have some exciting panel sessions lined up, so I look forward to some very productive discussions. And again, deep thanks to Patrick, uh, Brenda, and, and Karina for this wonderful invitation. Thanks so much. Uh, Ambassador Campbell, thank, we thank you very much for taking the time and, and joining us and for a very comprehensive and quite insightful presentation. We have a little bit of time left, so I'm wondering whether I, I could pose a couple of questions uh, to, to end our presentation. Um, so um, I, I'm just wondering, um, in your experience, um, what would you consider to be some of the most important uh, uh, implementation challenges uh, that were faced uh, in this three year period for, for CETA? Yeah, thanks. You know, I think actually the things that are challenging to implement are a real sign or testament of just how broad and comprehensive this agreement is. And I think that the fact that we're still working through um, on the EU side, their questions for us on various tariff rate quota administrations, but on our side, the importance um, to really implement the full agreement. In particular, I would take note of the conformity assessment. This is something that will allow for uh, certification of Canadian products in a one-stop shop across the EU, which was, I think, a real value added of the CETA agreement. We're still working on the details of that. And I would say, secondly, you know, the pandemic has shown us the importance of people-to-people -people ties. And I predict there's going to be a, a, an even deeper interest in, in understanding Europe and facilitating um, services, uh, students and, and business travel in 2021, 2022, when uh, the, the, the economies reopen uh, for easier travel. And that means the temporary entry provisions are really important. Um, there was also a question in the chat on CETA ratification. And of course, we continue to work really hard to make sure that the value of CETA uh, which is very clear across all of the member states, uh, continues. Uh, and of course, the agreement is in force. The, the parts that are under EU confidence are in, in force now and are already proving the value of the agreement to date. So we continue to work really closely with the European Commission and all member states on uh, the evidence, but also you know, the lived reality, um, particularly, I think, uh, we need to recognize the importance of climate change and environmental policies and uh, the power of green movements around the world. And here in Europe, uh, many green parties either form government or key parts of coalitions. Uh, I think this is a really important area for study. I know that, that your center is really paying attention to the platforms and policies of green parties, which I think are only gonna become more important and they've called on us you know, to really assess Canada's environmental track record, which I think is very strong. So again, you know, it's really important that while there are uh, macro questions about trade, about uh, investment agreements, and about how trade agreements can align with sustainable development goals, that we ask for Canada to be judged on its track record and present the information and data on that while continuing to constantly improve the agreement. Nothing about CETA should stand still. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, also, uh, one, one question that was in everyone's mind in the, the last few years is about Brexit and CETA. Uh, and I'm wondering whether uh, you can uh, offer any insight into um, what do you think are the expected impacts of Brexit and also the Canada-UK deal on, uh, on Canada-EU uh, trade agreement uh, and, and trade and investment relations in general? Yes, well, I think you know that I'm incredibly proud to have been named Canada's ambassador designate to the European Union. So I say that because, you know, I'm just gonna keep emphasizing and my focus will be on the Canada-EU deal um, while also building great bridges 
uh, for our supply chain partners and our researchers and innovators that do just a tremendous amount of work with the United Kingdom. So for me, this isn't like a choice between either or, it's how Canada has not missed a beat and has with our Canada-UK provisional agreement that will then transition um, as negotiations conclude into uh, the final form of our Canada-UK trade agreement uh, that we continue to provide uh, as many insights from the CETA process, which of course included the United Kingdom. Uh, and and I, I like to say until the UK left, we continue to be a fantastic CETA partner. Now we're in a new relationship with the UK, um, but of course we're watching how we can ensure that businesses uh, in particular understand uh, the dynamics of their bilateral export to the UK. And I think it's, you know, you really have to dig into the details of every supply chain, including rules of origin, accumulation, but also the real importance of you know, being able to move your talented people around, uh, open up subsidiary. You know, Canadian foreign affiliates actually sell more abroad out of their foreign affiliates globally than we export. Now we like exports, that's tremendous GDP value added and secures uh, jobs uh, and innovation, but continuing to keep an eye on how we are watching supply chain evolutions uh, and getting feedback uh, from stakeholders as these agreements become live is really important. So as you know, it's been quite a three months. Uh, we're almost at the end of Q1 here. Uh, it's, been, it's been quite a challenge um, for UK exporters. And uh, I think that we're learning a lot of lessons too around how we can continue to enable and support um, our small businesses. And we're happy to share those lessons uh, with others. Um, I, I think that gives you a sense of really the fact that our fundamental uh, position is to continue to make sure that we have strong and effective relationships with the UK and with the EU. And of course, that also builds out on the renewed NAFTA, the Canada-US-Mexico agreement, and the CPTPP, our bilaterals with the Ukraine uh, in the European context with South Korea. All of this provides an incredible global platform and preferential market access to billions of customers for what comes down to, to, to my role, which is of course, making a strong and resilient Canada. Thanks. Thank you so much. So I think it's a, it's a good uh, time to, to uh, thank you again for your intervention today. Uh, it's always great to hear you speak. We, we, we've been part of various events when you, you were held, holding a different position in global, global affairs. Um, and uh, we are really grateful that you had the time and avail availability and willingness to join us today. Um, so we would like to wish you uh, the best in uh, your quite still new position appointment. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you and hear uh, from you soon in other uh, occasions. Thank you. And let me just tell you about the importance of, of Carlton's work. And I see Amy Verdun on this uh, chat. And I would just say uh, the importance of the network across Canada of EU experts is more essential than ever. So kudos to Amy and her incredible team out, out on the West Coast, but Karina Yu and Patrick and the incredible Carlton U of O uh, team. And these centers of excellence are really important for inspiring students who then of course uh, can join us as fantastic trade negotiators and diplomats, but also the next generation of, of business and e-commerce leaders. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing the EU, I can tell you after 90 days back here on the ground, is not an easy entity <laughs> to wrap your mind around. And, and you know, I think, I think I only wish I had you and Amy and, your, and Patrick and your team at my briefings of the Prime Minister when I get asked again. So the European Council or, you know, uh, Deputy Ministers uh, asking me, you know, how many presidents are there in the EU institutions? Um, it's, it's a complex entity, but the bottom line is it's a fantastic partner and it's only getting more important. So thanks to all of you for your great work. Really appreciate our partnership. Thank you so much, Ambassador Campbell. Nice seeing you. Have a good day. Okay, so um, we are moving directly to our uh, first panel of the day. Um, 
the academic panel. Uh, you will uh, we'll have a chance to have a, a discussion uh, uh, and to pose questions at the end of this panel. We have with us four uh, great experts on, on CETA and trade in general. I will briefly introduce each panelist uh, in the order of, uh, of speaking. Um, for the full bios, uh, they can be accessed on uh, uh, the CETA conference uh, web page. Um, uh, so each speaker will have a maximum of uh, 15 minutes for opening remarks. And at the end, we will have um, a half an hour for Q&A. So you can pose your questions in the chat or uh, you can ask them directly if you raise your, your uh, digital hand and, uh, um, uh, you know, once I call your name. Um, so um, for the speakers from time to time, please uh, have a look at me uh, as I'll try to, to signal you when you have one or two minutes uh, left uh, for your presentation. Unfortunately, I have to announce that uh, uh, Dr. Nanette uh, New Newval uh, was unable to uh, join us today. A last minute uh, uh, personal uh, issue came up. Um, so we'll continue um, uh, with the academic panel with the other uh, four experts. So the first speaker of uh, today is Robert Fimbo, uh, Professor of Political Science and Deputy Director of the Jean Monnet European Union Center of Excellence at uh, Dalhousie University. Uh, Professor Fimbo's uh, current research focuses on the socially responsible elements of trade agreements, especially labor and social issues in NAFTA and the EU. Uh, his focus recently has been on Canada European uh, um, uh, economic and trade agreement, especially the implication for social policy and federalism. Uh, following Professor Finbo, we have Professor Michel Ryu, uh, a political, uh, professor of political science at Université uh, du Québec à Montréal and uh, director of the Centre d'études sur uh, l'intégration et uh, la mondial mondialisation. Um, her research focuses on international organizations and global governance, transnational firms, competition, the information society and the telecommunications sector, economic integration and regionalism, electronic commerce, digital and cultural industry. The third panelist is Valerie Derman, has been, who has been an instructor in the Department of Political Science since 2010 at the University of Victoria. Uh, Valerie's research interests include comparative political economy, theories of European integration, international relations, and European political parties. And finally, the, final, the, the last panelist, Xenia Polonskaya, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Law and Legal Studies here at Caltech University. She specializes in international investment and trade law. Her interests uh, include investor state arbitration, international trade law, comparative law, international commercial arbitration, and private law theory. Her current focus is in investment arbitration reform under the United Nations Commission of, on International Trade Law, the issues of gender equality in international institutions, and regional perspectives on trade. So having said that, uh, Robert, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, if you have PowerPoint uh, presentation, uh, you have the right to um, share them with us. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, obviously a uh, very exciting uh, uh, group of individuals you've brought together. And of course, it's not easy to follow the ambassador who is a wealth of information also presented us uh, very effectively, I think. Um, what I'm going to try to do is talk about uh, mostly our project and the project outcomes. I'll just say a little bit about uh, ratification and some of the potential political challenges and issues going forward. But mostly I want to concentrate on the project because we had a uh, Jean Monnet uh, funded Erasmus project on CETA implementation and implications. And um, we have just more or less wrapped that up. The, the book is now being vetted uh, for peer review by McGill Queens University Press. And I think a couple of the contributors may in fact be in the audience. Um, so I'm gonna spend most of the time on that. Uh, but uh, I do wanna comment a bit about the uh, 
ratification, because of course that's important to what, which elements of CETA are able to be implemented at this point. I'm not gonna go through all the chapters because people here will be more expert on some of them than I am and on the limitations of provisional implementation. But you'll know of course that it, uh, CETA was designated a mixed agreement and therefore requires elements to be ratified by the national parliaments. And, um, whoops, I'm gonna have to still learn how to do this properly. Hang on a second. Okay, I think I got it. Got it? Yeah, so uh, ratification as, as indicated in the chat comment and the response earlier is in fact a very slow process. And uh, many states have not yet ratified. A majority now have, but many states have not yet ratified. We had a couple of German scholars involved in our project and they were skeptical in terms of constitutional impediments. Uh, some court cases, of course, have justified, uh, legitimized the provisional implementation uh, and uh, set aside some objections from political parties. On the other hand, there's still some uh, court cases pending before the German constitutional court. Uh, France has got uh, national assembly approval, but not Senate approval, although I understand that it is being uh, reconsidered at the moment uh, in that body. Uh, uh, Italy, uh, one of the geographic indicator issues, uh, 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 has affected their treatment of our Durham wheat and uh, threats of non-ratification, at least by the nationalist uh, uh, government there. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, my colleague Amy Verdun referred to Cyprus and the Netherlands, Cyprus involving a cheese product, uh, and uh, again, suggestions that they might not ratify unless certain concerns are, certain concerns are addressed. The one I'm most familiar with recently is the Irish one, which is ongoing, uh, involving a backbench uh, member of the coalition who's actually taken a high court uh, case forward, claiming that the, the, uh, the investment court system uh, proposed in CETA would be a transfer of sovereignty because of its uh, uh, quasi-judicial elements and would be incompatible with the constitution. So some people are suggesting that CETA would require a referendum to be approved in Ireland but constitutional scholars I was discussing this with uh, recently have suggested that probably is not the case, but nonetheless, it's an example of the various types of challenges which have emerged since provisional implementation, which keep the uh, process ongoing and, and uh, have provided some delays. Many of these have been set aside, but they're, they continue to, uh, to arise. Um, this gives you a sense here of the fact that uh, you have a fair range of states who, which have uh, um, ratified, of course, ironically, one of them being the United Kingdom, which is Canada's largest trade partner in Europe, uh, which of course is no longer in the union. Uh, and uh, as you can see as well, several other major states, larger economies have not yet uh, ratified, including Germany, Italy, France. Uh, and a number of uh, Central European states as well still have to uh, ratify. Uh, so again, it's something that's likely to move forward slowly and, and many of you uh, from your positions of expertise may have a more updated sense of where things are at in some of the countries that have not yet ratified, but uh, it's, it's certainly uh, an ongoing set, a, a source of uh, uncertainty about uh, some aspects of the agreement as we'll see. Um, so, so let me talk about the project. And we had an Erasmus plus John Monet project uh, and we ended up uh, having scholars from a variety of European states. And we were able to cover several of the essential and contentious areas of CETA in the final product, including investment, regulation, procurement, uh, social uh, sustainability and the environment uh, issues. Um, and also some of the complex issues in negotiation and the governance structures and their compatibility with uh, democratic uh, processes, etc. Originally, we had scholars who were studying agri-food and geographic indicators, intellectual promisey, uh, property, pharmaceuticals, and Brexit, but they did not uh, end up uh, in the final stages of the project for various uh, career reasons, etc. We also had stakeholders from civil society, business and government, 
And they also participated at first, but did not contribute to our final product. Most of those individuals have their own means of publishing and are able to get uh, their timely pieces out without some of the delays of peer review. So that choice, uh, of course, does make some sense. Uh, for, the, for the team itself, um, the multinational, multilingual, and multi-generational scholarship was quite impressive. We were able to get together a team of many, uh, uh, some veteran and many emerging scholars uh, from a variety of European states, as well as uh, various Canadian and American institutions. Um, and uh, they used a variety of different methods and approaches with very different disciplinary backgrounds, theoretical and methodological uh, approaches. Uh, and, you know, for instance, the legal scholarship of some of the uh, chapters uh, in the final product is quite impressive. Um, and they used the US, uh, data from a variety of EU databases, documents, some direct interviews with officials, academic and civil society, etc. So a very rich basis of, uh, uh, of, of, of echoing, echoing there. <coughs> a very rich basis of, um, of scholarship to um, uh, underlay the foundations for the book. So I don't want to give too many spoilers from the book because we need, of course, some of you to, to buy it. Uh, but the project emphasis, I think, again, you, it's, you can't integrate the insights from all those disciplines completely uh, because they have very different orientations and backgrounds. But there was a general sense in which balance, oversight, trust in the organizations uh, that were developed uh, is substantially cons considered substantially important. So, um, for instance, the uh, uh, area of committees and governance, we had two German scholars who were writing in this area, uh, and the concern there being to balance democratic legitimacy with the efficiency of the transnational government uh, mechanisms that are being created. So, understanding the committee structures needed to be effective, but on the other hand, concerns that they might not sufficiently report to domestic or EU uh, representative institutions. Uh, and so you can see the two scholars here, uh, uh, Felix Stern, uh, 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 Professor Weiss, um, uh, on the need to ensure that balance is sought and perhaps find ways to enhance the European Parliament oversight role after implementation to ensure some elements of democratic accountability. On the regulatory cooperation side, um, also a sense that uh, there's a very complex new system working its way through the regular, regulatory cooperation forum. Uh, and um, the emphasis of the scholars seemed to be on the sense that you needed to create a foundation of trust uh, so that the, it, various participants could uh, engage in a constructive way to move the process forward, sort of the relating to what the ambassador said, sort of making sure that the voices get involved and are heard in the process. Um, some, of course, suggesting that uh, the you might need some sort of uh, multilateral regulatory instrument to protect uh, less powerful non-economic interests and balance the right to regulate with regulatory cooperation. Um, but uh, also emphasizing how national democratic checks and balances will play into the process. Um, so so uh, that is an example of one of the areas where balance was solved. On the area of procurement, um, generally a sense that the um, pr provisions and the thresholds are going to be a, an effective starting point for this process. Uh, but that there may be, in fact, uh, issues involving uh, getting smaller entities in particular to be able to take advantage of the process. And I think the ambassador also referred to uh, small and medium enterprises and how they may have particular challenges. Uh, higher transaction costs were referred to by our participants, for instance, uh, and the need to create various programs that could uh, uh, facilitate their engagement in the procurement process. Well, and of course, the construction of the central portal for um, uh, procurement uh, across multi-levels 
in Canada, of course, is still proceeding. Uh, one uh, team, the father-daughter professors, Schwartz and Schwartz, uh, suggested that, you know, given past procurement practices, disruption from CEDA unlikely to be substantial, that most of the municipalities were already looking to maximize uh, benefits and costs. And so European companies have been part of that uh, for a while. And if there are concerns about uh, local or social uh, uh, fallout or tie-ins, uh, carefully worded community benefit agreements might allow some of those local public policy concerns to be factored in alongside, of course, the thresholds that protect uh, certain types of contracts for local uh, players. Uh, the investment court system, and I think one of our colleagues is going to talk about that shortly, um, is of course one of the more contentious areas and also one of the ones that's on hold uh, because provisional implementation cannot address that given the mixed character of the agreement and the member state competence in that area. So um, the uh, process is on hold, but the uh, uh, CETA Joint Committee, of course, is in fact preparing and planning for that eventuality or that prospect. And as you can see, have set forward uh, criteria uh, and, and, and uh, goals. And of course, uh, you can find on the uh, uh, Global Affairs website and other places, the specific uh, wording of these uh, aspects. Uh, one of our scholars did a comparative piece on Canada's various agreements uh, and noted, of course, that one of the challenges going forward will be to see how the ICS uh, is in fact uh, linked in to Canada's other agreements that all have different uh, versions of ISDS uh, measures. And, and of course, the reformed NAFTA, which has uh, dropped that for Canada US. Uh, so there's going to be a, a, that one of the learning challenges for Canada will be how to integrate that and whether those will be conflicting. Um, and uh, 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 another scholar uh, uh, suggested that in, a, in a very carefully reasoned legal uh, chapter that uh, there's a need to acknowledge and measure perceptions of diverse constituencies engaged in I ICS and also improve the normative legitimacy of the ISDS process, which of course has been questioned by some in civil society. I think one of the, my colleagues on this panel will be talking about some aspects of that transnationally. So the sustainability chapters, again, I would suggest a search for concern for balance, uh, uh, anticipation about the creation of new structures, uh, civil society consultations, uh, alongside continued skepticism by some uh, civil society organizations uh, and uncertainty about exactly how these will play out. Uh, so we had a variety of, uh, uh, this is a trio of young uh, female scholars uh, in legal and policy areas from the European Union uh, and presented very effectively again on the need to make these provisions work, which requires, of course, political will to sort out the tensions between the potential sustainability problems of liberalization and the goals of uh, Canada and EU's commitment, as the ambassador outlined as well, to the Paris obligations and sustainability. So unsurprisingly, that's one of the key early priorities for the Joint Committee is to focus on climate effects. Um, Another chapter looks at the specific issues involved with energy flows and with fossil fuels and the uh, impact that these will have in particular in stretching the boundaries of the sustainability chapter because of course, depending on the types of fuels, uh, those can be of course have a very negative uh, impact on the, on the climate. Uh, and, and again, uh, we're gonna hear, hear from uh, uh, Professor Yu shortly about the labor and human rights elements. Um, but again, the issue here is sort of the trust but verify kind of sense from some scholars in civil society that you might need to have ongoing impact assessments to make sure that CETA's impact on workers and unions is consistent with protection of a uh, high level of, uh, of uh, worker rights uh, and protections. So there's still skepticism as, as suggest of whether the forums will function effectively. I assume and I see in the audience that some members who 
that some of the attendees who may be involved in civil society forums might be here and they can speak, of course, more to the progress that's being made in that area. Um, and then, of course, this balancing of the right to regulate, which is an important statement of principles, uh, not to deviate from environmental or label, labor protections, uh, to encourage trade or investment. So that's, those are uh, important senses in which these scholars thought balance was required. And I'll be interested to hear what others in civil society have to say about that. <clears throat> the other aspect is, of course, we've only dipped our toe into a few areas. As I mentioned, we had a few others involved in the project who were not able to, to sustain their participation. But if you look at the uh, frameworks involved, and this is a uh, table I designed with some sample sense of what needs to be done at what levels in this very complex multi-level uh, implementation process. So you know, there will be a growth industry for policy experts and academics to focus on specific as aspects of this involving the new committees, involving uh, dialogues, involving uh, central institutions in the commission and the federal government, member states, provinces, and federalism uh, uh, writ large, the impact on municipalities, and professional associations that have mentioned with the architects and others who are moving, trying to move forward on mutual recognition agreements. So there's no end of complexities here, and I would certainly see, having been involved in this for a while, that no one scholar uh, uh, or no one interest could uh, possibly be fully expert on all of these aspects. So it will be a fascinating to watch how this evolves scholarly wise. Um, uh, this is a basic <clears throat> premise of the current benefits. And of course the global affairs uh, individuals will have more updated and, and specific ones, but you can see of course the, as the ambassador indicated, um, the increase in commerce flows uh, is evident. And that does amount, of course, to billions of dollars of trade in each direction. Um, there is the trade imbalance issue and that may or may not grow more important over time, um, uh, but it's an imbalance both in terms of volume, as was noted by the ambassador, but also uh, value added areas and of course that's complicated because of the complexity differentiation and value across a variety of sectors uh the, some critics suggested for instance that canada is basically importing audis and exporting rocks uh but of course that uh, uh simplifies and doesn't take into account all the supply chains the new possibilities in terms of services etc but it does remain something worth watching in terms of the long-term benefits for Canada or uh, for the EU. So uh, uh, in the pandemic, post-pandemic context, of course, it's gonna be very important because we not only have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have not only have the pandemic recovery, but we also have the nationalist uh, pushback in some areas and the rejection of some aspects of the multilateral institutions. Uh, 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 so that so it will be seen as sort of an important backstop for that recovery. Um, and uh, I'll just conclude by going over some of the uh, political concerns that might be coming to the fore. And the ambassador alluded to the agricultural sector, talking about early issues. And I know that some of the concerns from the agricultural sector uh, continue, and there is a high degree of dissatisfaction among some producer sectors with how CETA has been implemented at this point, uh, the responses of member states and uh, regulators uh, uh, to uh, Canadian products. Uh, again, that's an ongoing process, dialogue uh, in the Agricultural Committee, and of course, presumably elevated to the Joint Committee because of the key political issues involved. And that's gonna be an issue for Canada going forward is the regional effects, because that's always a key concern in Canadian politics. Uh, the fact that Manitoba, Saskatchewan may have fewer gains so far than some other provinces, whether the meat sector in some provinces is faring more poorly, whether the dairy sector facing uh, issues is actually being better compensated than the meat sector, et cetera. Those types of small issues that seem 
trivial become very critical politically, given the character of the Canadian political system of Canadian federalism, and of course the uh, uh, electoral system that uh, makes those local representatives concerned about those issues important, especially in a close parliament like we've had recently. Uh, the pandemic, uh, obviously people will be working on this in more detail, uh, but uh, there does seem to be, of course, the challenges for small and medium enterprises and particularly particular because they've had to close for extended periods of time and reduce their production capacity uh, during the pandemic. Uh, it was reassuring to see the uh, ambassador refer to the vaccine issue. So I think that's a generally a broad problem that Canada's created for itself in these deals is certain areas of uh, importance are no longer produced domestically. So we're uh, in fact having to negotiate with bigger players like the Americans, the Europeans for access to life-saving supplies. Uh, and that's something that goes beyond CETA, but is generally as a, a sense in which Canada may not have overall protected its self-interest in that area. Uh, Brexit, of course, and uh, we won't be hearing the presentation on Brexit that was scheduled, unfortunately, but Brexit, uh, EU was, of course, Canada's largest trading partner. So interesting to see how the parallel agreement uh, plays out but also how that affects the overall trade balance with Europe, uh, with the EU, uh, with that uh, portion of Canadian trade uh, removed from the uh, CETA framework. Um, and uh, overall, I would just suggest that, and certainly from the participants in the project, that you know, there are promising civil society processes for monitoring, some of them new and innovative, but political will is definitely required to make these processes work. So uh, again, the commitment seems to be there, but uh, civil society organizations and from my past participation in these types of consultations, I have to push quite hard to make sure that the attention is actually paid. And so the social balances across regions, classes, social groups, which of course is, was alluded to by the ambassador. So promising that those are in the scope uh, or in the uh, sites of the government uh, decision makers. And of course, the Joint Committee is working on gender, climate, uh, small and medium enterprises, as we mentioned. So just to conclude, as a political scientist, not necessarily a trade specialist in this case, um, overall, I would suggest that if the benefits of these deals and globalization in general uh, are narrow or perceived to be narrowed if, if more people are losing good jobs than gaining them from these types of processes. Uh, you know, that is a tool of uh, fuel for populism. And my work on the American case and also doing comparative work on the five eyes countries, the five Anglo-Saxon English speaking countries uh, shows that these types of issues can be seized upon by populist uh, to push back against immigration, but also push back against trade arrangements. Canada is in a better position. There's no strong uh, condemnation of open trade yet, uh, despite the opposition's rhetoric now in China. But as we see with Trump, uh, you know, that can play out as a serious backlash against these type of liberalizing frameworks. So a socially responsible system, I think, is essential to ensure broad benefits from the efficiencies of global integration, but also preserving social cohesion and ensuring that a maximum number of individuals and social constituencies are actually benefiting. Otherwise you risk uh, political backlash against op open commerce and one might argue against democratic practices uh, to some degree as well as we've seen happening in much of the Western world. So. With that, I mean, I have other slides basically for information purposes if people need to touch on certain questions, uh, but I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to my colleagues. And thank you very much again for, uh, for your invitation and attention. Thank you, Robert. Um, so in fact, we do have, we will have a bit later a, a presentation on Brexit as uh, Dr. Newhall was able to join us the last minute. Um, and having said that, I would uh, uh, I would also ask the speakers if you can be aware of their the time of the presentation, just to leave some time for for discussions at the end, 
And please have a look at me because I'm waving here in different ways to signals when you use the signal when you have one or two minutes uh, left. So we'll continue with uh, uh, Michelle Liu. First of all, thank you for Ambassador Campbell and uh, Robert Fondo for the excellent presentation. Uh, thank you for all the participants to be there. There's a, a great crowd. Uh, I'm happy to be with you and thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here. I'm the director of the Center for Research on Integration and Globalization based at LUCAM uh, in um, Montreal. We've been uh, uh, basically working on globalization and integration from a North American perspective. Um, so I'm in no way uh, or an expert on, on the European Union, but we have been doing a lot of comparative research. And of course, with the CETA, uh, this has been reactivated as uh, an element, very strong element of our research. Um, not only asking you know, uh, what it means for Canada and, and North America, but also what it means in terms of the bigger picture, you know, in terms of uh, looking at uh, trade agreements and economic agreements and maybe how the you know, CETA represent a new uh, paradigm and uh, in what way it can be a new paradigm, not only in words, but also um, in practice. So I would say that uh, you know one year um, into uh, you know the implementation, I would say let's keep going on the pragmatic aspect and to go beyond words because you know that agreement uh, when we look at it the way it was negotiated negotiated, very difficult and complex process, very innovative process in many ways in terms of you know not only the trade sustainability uh, chapters, but also regulatory cooperation in terms of the process of uh, uh, you know, trying to reach out on, into the participatory uh, processes and also uh, uh, creating a, 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 um, a new type of agreement that can be evolutive. You know, we know that things change a lot and you know, we can't just go back and forth and reopen you know, uh, closed deals. So I think it, there is a lot of, of, um, of um, uh, expectation in terms of what it can deliver still. Um, so today I will talk about basically, um, and, and thank you Robert for having like, you know, just presented such a big and great overview of everything, uh, I would like to focus on the regulatory aspect. I think, I think there's, there are many um, great innovation in that, that uh, CETA uh, that can be great for Canada, for, for the EU, and also for the rest of the world for that matter, uh, if it can be influential and be uh, replicated. Um, but per perhaps the most important for me is the opening of regulatory cooperation. Um, perhaps it is because you know Canada and the EU share a lot of uh, many great uh, approaches in terms of regulation, uh, uh, but it, it is something that for me is the way of the future. And the globalization and you know what Robert was talking about about the backlash and the populism and the reaction against trade agreement. I think for, you know we have to listen to that as something that is uh, as revealed. Uh, you know, uh, what's what was going wrong with, with trade agreements. And I think that CEDA can solve a lot of this uh, by opening up regulatory um, cooperation. Why is this? Because regulatory cooperation is not only about talking about, you know, what is a regulation uh, doing in terms of blocking, uh, you know, potentially or, uh, you know, a, a product or a service for market access. You know, it's not only about that. It's not about, you know, let's make sure that the regulation are not barriers, you know, to trade and investment. It's also a way to acknowledge the fact that globalization in institutions, you know, um, needs to, to um, um, uh, get into what kind of regulation are necessary, for instance, to make, uh, uh, you know, products safer, uh, environmentally safe, you know, a sound, uh, and take into co uh, consideration the, the labor input aspect and the way it was produced and the way uh, it is marketed and distributed around the world, uh, you know, without or without or with attention to the way the way it is uh, satisfactorily, uh, you know, um, uh, responding to norms that are, uh, you know, set into the public for the public interest. 
Uh, I will come back to that. So um, we can call this, you know, like um, regulatory cooperation for against protectionism that would be unsound and regulatory cooperation that would be more into what Pascal Lamy has been talking about as precautionism, you know, uh, you know, the, the principe de, de précaution. And so in what way, where do we want to go into that positive regulation and build norms so that you know trade can be more in tune with regulatory aspect that is um, not only done to make uh, trade and investment like more liberal, but also in tune with what a society needs as institution and rules and 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 of the game to protect itself. You know, I think in the pandemic it's it's becoming more uh, important as well. We'll come back to that. So. Um, I would like to talk more about the labor chapter because I think there are a lot of, you know, in the, the trade um, sustainability chapters, there is the labor chapter. I do not know much about the, env the env environmental side, but I will talk about the labor chapter. I think that's very interesting because for the longest time we've been talking about the North American approach to labor norms and trade agreements. Uh, North American and Canadian, and also the uh, EU approach. And most of, uh, of the time, it was negotiated ne negotiated with you know uh, less developed countries. Um, so it was the first agreement that actually in between you know industrialized countries. So it's it cannot be like believed to be like imperialistic legal imperialism or something like that. Or um, I think it's a very good um, a, a bridge, you know, towards like uh, asking ourselves uh, what not only what are the norms because I think Canada and the EU in the in the ILO, uh, you know, agree on most of the norms and convention and etc. But you know, what kind of um, uh, a process, uh, what kind of um, uh, enforcement mechanism, what kind of participation from the public uh, can be uh, open in, in, in this segment. So I think there's a lot of uh, involvement in the civil society forum. There is a lot of of discussion about the role of the domestic uh, advisory, uh, advisory groups and their collaboration uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, and there, I think, there is about three um, uh, issues that are very important to me is the way Canada and the EU will address uh, the value chain, the global value chain. And that can reach into you know, the importance of this agreement and its extra uh, territorial uh, impact that it can have, you know, for instance, with the CPP, the, the, the countries, the Asian countries or elsewhere in the world. This is gonna be very important. And that's why I come back to my first line, you know, pragmatism beyond words. I think that uh, Canada and you agree on words, but how to address those difficult questions uh, is really for me um, in the future, uh, the unfinished business as, as we, we can say of this agreement. There is also another um, uh, issue that is very important. I remember when, um, uh, there was, uh, you know, this discussion about the investment uh, state uh, mechanism. We talked about the labor inequality. So the balancing act of labor versus investors' right is really important, and it's not a finished discussion. I think the uh, we have to put a lot of emphasis on enforcement. Even though Canada and the EU do not, you know, they do not agree right now on sanctions or anything that would be like a, a more mighty uh, enforcement mechanism, I think uh, there is a lot of room uh, to 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 invent, you know, in that respect and to uh, cross uh, maybe not, you know. Half, you know, it's it, it's you know of, of of the ocean for this, but I mean we, there is there is room uh, to uh, to actually uh, make a compromise. Um, what is the mechanism of complaints? You know, can the ILO play a bigger role? Um, all of these questions also uh, must be answered. What you know, if we argue on sanction, what is the process of sanction? We have different ways of dealing with this in North America than in the EU. Um, so, what is the agenda setting, especially in the pandemic time? You know, every country's 
like it or not, is going to launch, relaunch, you know, the, the economy and et cetera, it's going to bring up a lot of, um, you know, unfair competition issues and a, a lot of, um, I would say, uh, you know, important questions that I think regulatory cooperation in terms of labor, uh, you know, can, 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 can answer. The last thing that I want to say is about the great, great, great challenge, not only of the pandemics, but also the digital trend, um, uh, the digital transition uh, that the pandemic has actually <laughs> exacerbated, and it has transformed the world of work. So this is an issue that regulatory labor cooperation can tackle and is very important for the shape of the world. Um, of course, with the uh, collaboration of, of the ILO, which I think uh, is doing a lot of great things on that. Um, and the bigger picture, uh, and I'll finish with that, um, is the fact that, uh, you know, this agreement is not only innovative, but I think it can be the way to the future. But if we do not answer and go into that regular regulatory cooperation, I think that it's going to be a brighter future, but not a great future. And I think it's our responsibility, not only for climate change and labor cooperation, that we in, indulge into that regulatory cooperation and take it very seriously. So I thank you a lot. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, so we'll continue with Valerie, uh, who will speak about the Canadian procurement in the post-Brexit era. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Karina and Patrick, for inviting me to this excellent workshop presentation today. I think it's incredibly timely, and it's a very nice way to touch base with CETA scholars across Canada, as well as um, uh, practitioners and students and everyone interested uh, in CETA and where we are at for such a substantial agreement. I, um, uh, I, this has been um, an earlier research project that I'm now kind of coming back into for two reasons. One is um, uh, research and publications. Another is a year from now, I will be I'm developing a new course on called the politics of trade for my department. And I very much want to bring in CETA related issues to that. So that is, uh, this is a really timely and wonderful opportunity for me. So again, thank you for inviting me and thank you for having me. Just to give you a quick overview of what I will talk about. So my, the, the focus of my interest on CETA has been on public procurement. And uh, Robert's uh, reference to chapters in his upcoming uh, book that I'm really excited to see that will speak to this. Uh, procurement, I'm speaking to an audience who's very well versed uh, within trade agreements, particularly in the Canadian context. Uh, procurement, of course, we're referring to public procurement, the purchasing of goods and services by public authorities with public funds. And um, this is this this has been this was and continues to be a very visible part of the CETA agreement, both within the, the negotiations and in the aftermath as well. So what I'd like to do in this very brief presentation, and I'll keep an eye on the time, is to um, kind of give some broad strokes of what happened with CETA and where we could potentially be going. Um, and also thinking of this not only as CETA qua itself, but in the context of larger developments, which I will uh, touch on very briefly. And then looking at what this all could have as an impact. And I'll look at the larger developments, but I'll just uh, take a few minutes to talk about Brexit specifically. So that is my aim for today. Uh, let me just start with public procurement in Canada. <laughs> Procurement is a significant issue for both any EU member state, the EU as a whole as a single market, but also for uh, Canada as well. When it's considered as a fraction of total government expenditures, a sort of um, you know malleable average that's come and gone, or come and gone, that is uh, mostly held itself, is that we can estimate that uh, public procurement accounts for about one third of total public spending in Canada, if you put all all levels of government and public authorities together. And that on the whole is maybe slightly larger in, in the EU, but it's a, it's, it's a fairly reasonable balance of parallel. 
So procurement becomes very topical for international trade agreements, not just for the sheer amount of money alone. It's not just economics. Another big aspect is that procurement is also a critical issue in terms of public support and local economic development. Um, so the purchasing of goods and services by public authorities has uh, sometimes taken on that um, uh, that more local social labor developmental role as well in terms of committing to uh, taking bids and purchasing goods and services from local aspects. All of this to say that when engaging in international trade agreements, the idea of liberalizing public procurement, making these large scale purchases open to um, bidders from other countries can become quite provocative. Now for Canada specifically, Canada was already a signatory to the, to the World Trade Organization's Agreement on Government Procurement, first developed in 96 and then updated in 2014. Uh, but Canada prior to CETA had allowed for federal procurement to be open to, um, uh, to non-Canadian bids over a certain threshold, and to some extent within NAFTA, certain kinds of provincial bids. CETA was the first preferential trade agreement to involve municipal procurement at the municipal level. And this is quite significant because uh, some, some of the largest purchases take place at the municipal level. Uh, so this was, this initiated um, a certain precedent that was quite notable. So we have the WTO, we have CETA. What is parallel to CETA, and I'll say something about this in just a second as well, is Canada's updated internal trade agreement, the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. This was an update, update of the existing agreement on internal trade. Lots of commentary took place in 2017 when this was underway, as I'm sure the audience is well aware, in terms of how the CFTA was in many ways instigated by CETA. So various quotes in the Globe and Mail, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, talking about how if NAFTA uh, gave us the original AIT in the 90s, CETA has now given us the, the, the CFTA. A made, for those that are focused on a particular policy area, the CFTA was notable for public procurement in that what was necessary is that Canadian municipalities, Canadian um, uh, procurement tenders had to open themselves up to each other. And this is perhaps another way where we can see the, um, the leverage of the EU single market on the Canadian single market within the CETA agreement. Uh, the EU in and amongst itself as a single market had opened up its procurement to each other, had already had a very high degree of um, comfort with that process. Canada, by contrast, less so in that the Canadian internal market Canada being a very decentralized federation, the Canadian internal market is subject to various kinds of, um, if not barriers, obstacles perhaps between different levels of provincial and territorial procurement as well as municipal procurement as well. So the CFTA in many ways mirrored some of the asks and results from CETA in that municipalities could consider bids from other provinces, from other municipalities, and as well, which uh, Robert mentioned and this has been a very uh, significant point of what the Canadian procurement market needs to do to respect its trade agreements uh, to develop a single point of access uh, for online using digital technology. Uh, lastly, 2018, so the update of NAFTA, uh, the US-Mexico-Canadian agreement, Canada is not a party to the, is no longer a party to a North American procurement agreement. So that is now maintained in USMCA, <laughs> very uh, inelegant acronym. Uh, Canada is not a party to Chapter 13 in, in the updated agreement. So it is kind of um, uh, subject more to WTO um, thresholds and rules with various modifications between Canada and the US. So CETA on public procurement, uh, this was a critical ask 
of the European Union. Essentially, the, the, the EU wanted access to these large municipal tenders that were being put forward in Canada. So this was a very visible part of early negotiations uh, that ended up necessitating the involvement of provinces directly in trade negotiations. So prior to CETA, trade negotiations were um, uh, kind of the status quo default were conducted by the federal government alone and the trade commissioner of the government of Canada. Uh, the European Union's trade or, or organizers, negotiators, very aware that uh, municipal procurement would be a touchy subject and that uh, even provincial procurement could be a, a difficult um, set of negotiations in terms of working through thresholds and exemptions, etc., cetera, uh, were I'm trying to use a neutral, <laughs> were very emphatic in bringing the provinces to the negotiation table. So this, uh, this was, in hindsight, quite a visible part of trade negotiations and trade developments as well since then. There were some protests uh, visibly within certain municipalities, uh, Hamilton, Ontario, Nanaimo, British Columbia, a handful of others. Uh, and the degree to which those the form that those protests took were very much emphatic on the political aspect of local, social, and labor development of the abilities of, of municipal procurement to invest in local circumstances. What resulted in the, uh, in the final text of CETA was the EU essentially got its major ask, the access to municipal procurement. There are buffers within there, though. There are various uh, thresholds, uh, whether it's construction, other services, et cetera. There is a negative list approach in the Chapter 19 text on the CETA agreement, Chapter 19 being the chapter on public procurement. So whereas the bulk of the CETA agreement uses a positive list approach, that meaning unless something is already exempt, then it is included in CETA, Chapter 19 has the opposite. Uh, only the things that are specifically included in Chapter 19 are a part of the public procurement exchange between Canada and, and the EU. Otherwise, it is assumed that is not. Now, we've only had three years of CETA coming into place. And uh, as I'll say on, on the next slide, those three years have been buffered by various kinds of uh, international events. Some were foreseen, some were not. Uh, so in terms of data on what has happened, what has happened to Canadian municipalities, what has what have been the results for Canadian businesses in terms of being able to access the vast procurement market within the, the European Union, perhaps maybe not quite enough time. One thing that um, I noticed Robert raised and I would very much like to echo is that the, uh, the options for small and medium enter enterprises, SMEs, are somewhat limited by the amount of resources needed to be able to access municipal tenders on the EU side. And of course, another one is um, that uh, this, this single point of access has yet to be, thanks Karina, has yet to be fully developed within the Canadian side. Okay, so going forward, what have we seen since uh, the 2016 signing of CETA and the 2017 provisional application? Well, we ha there have been a number of trade developments. Uh, of course, Canada being neighbor to the United States, largest market, uh, there has been maybe somewhat hyperbolic within the news at times, but there has been a definite kind of um, movement towards less external activity and much more, uh, you could call it protectionism or you could, um, or you could simply say more uh, reluctance perhaps to broadly embrace open international trade. And we see this with the temporary aluminum tariffs on Canada, uh, various aspects during the Trump administration of wanting to focus on jobs, even if it's at the cost of consumer goods, uh, US-China trade tensions, uh, the new administration coming into the U.S., which has very much doubled down on continuing the Buy America policies, meaning uh, trying to keep federal procurement levels within the U.S. for local. And of course, the COVID pandemic, which is sort of the, the, the background air that everyone is breathing when talking about trade negotiations. Uh, COVID has for the narrower area of public procurement, you could say COVID's done a number of things, but uh, for the narrow area, the, the first wave when the pandemic first took off in um, 
uh, March of 2020, what I think was very visible to citizens as much as businesses was uh, what was perceived, certainly in the news, as the weaknesses of some existing procurement strategies for securing local needs. Going forward, though, however, there has been a lot of attention to what is this COVID recovery going to look like? And OECD reports and many other um, areas have uh, suggested that public procurement is going to perhaps become a very strategic element for kickstarting economies and for instigating uh, local investment and, and stimulus in many ways. So that will be interesting to see going forward what the choices are when looking at uh, procurement purchases. And then of course, Brexit and the resultant agreements um, and the different provisions of what the UK has negotiated with both the EU and the Trade and Cooperation Agreement and with Canada and the Trade Continuity Agreement. So just in the last minute, uh, one thing I will highlight is that this is from uh, 2017, and uh, this is from uh, Trade Commissioner data on the Government of Canada website, is looking at the size of the procurement market. So this is just a snapshot of um, the highest spenders of the EU in 2017, and then a mean, and Ireland as well, as Ireland has um, uh, is a, a, a prime trade partner for Canada now post Brexit within the European Union, and you can see that the UK is a sizable spender uh, with was a sizable spender within the EU procurement market, but in general is. Um, uh, has a lot of tenders that would be of great interest for the Canadian market. So the aspect of Brexit and the, um, the conclusion of Brexit uh, in the various forms of TCAs coming out of the UK are interesting. Uh, the trade and cooperation agreement with the UK has it, to some extent, and legal experts can easily weigh in and correct me on this, has dialed down some of the deeper procurement obligations that existed when the UK was embedded within the EU single market. At the same time, what Canada and the UK have um, signaled in their early TCA, the, the Trade Continuity Agreement, uh, has been to effectively continue the provisions of CETA. This, and I'll just go to uh, the, my last slide here, this could have very positive implications for uh, Canadian businesses and for um, uh, Canadian uh, purchases externally, is that Canada maintains uh, preferential access to procurement markets in both the EU and the UK following Brexit. And that could um, be significant given that simultaneously the US is uh, has become, at least whether temporarily or long term remains to be seen, has uh, moved somewhat more um, protectionist in its stance in terms of encouraging uh, full openness between the Canadian and the US markets. At the stage right now that the TCA between the EU and the UK is, the, their own TCA, their cooperation agreement, is more in line with the WTO GPA norms. So Canada right now on paper potentially enjoys more access. Now, the other, of course, uh, aspect is what does this do to our own bids, our, our, our own tenders and subject to which bids and where. So as Robert noted, the trade deficit that Canada has with the EU has not narrowed uh, since 2017. It might have even widened in certain ways. This does mean that our own procurement market at the municipal level is open to EU bids. Also, with the continuation of um, CEDA norms within the Canada-EU TCA, open to UK bids as well. So this could have various effects. You know, you would need much longer, I think, maybe 10 years that not necessarily always couched in a pandemic uh, to kind of get more data on this. And uh, one thing I would really be interested in doing is maybe pursuing data on specific municipalities over a longer period of time to see what has this done, how and why, what were the anticipated effects, what were the indirect effects. So just to uh, conclude, this could foster um, this could indirectly stimulate more cross-Atlantic engagement in various ways. 
it could also um, very much change the kinds of tenders being put forth by Canadian municipalities, depending on the concern of exposure to both UK and um, EU bids in various ways. So I will stop there. I'll stop sharing my screen and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Valérie. Um, as you end it, uh, your discussion on Brexit, I think we can continue with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nanette Newhold um, that will uh, talk about CETA and Brexit. Um, I, uh, uh, Dr. Newhold is an associate professor of the Faculty of Law at the Université de Montréal and holds a Jean Monnet chair in European Union law. Nanette, you are muted. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Krina, for uh, inviting me here. It is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm sorry for being late. Uh, I had a little bit of a health care, but uh, I, uh, I, I'm really happy to be with you. My subject, this is the second time I'm at Carlton virtually. Uh, it was a real pleasure last time to speak about Hungary, and now uh, we'll address uh, CETA, and I'm asked to address uh, CETA and Brexit. Uh, this is a topic which will be uh, dealt with also in a book which I'm editing together with, uh, with uh, Amy Verdun uh, on, uh, on CETA, and uh, uh, Valerie will also be uh, contributing to this book, I'm pleased to see, and Patrick Leblanc. Also, so CETA and uh, Brexit, um, I will be dealing with the uh, most important uh, effects on Canadian uh, uh, companies of uh, Brexit under CETA. Uh, and I will be doing so uh, mainly from the theoretical viewpoint. We are still investigating the, uh, uh, the practical uh, implications for uh, companies at the moment, also at the University of Montreal. But I would like to speak about the uh, theoretical uh, implications for Canadian companies, taking into account also the uh, UK's uh, trade and cooperation agreement that was mentioned, which was uh, signed in December uh, 2020, and which is uh, at the moment uh, provisionally into force. Um, uh, uh, pending ratification. Uh, by the European Parliament and also taking into account uh, the UK's temporary uh, trade and continuity agreement uh, with Canada that was uh, concluded uh, November uh, 2020 and which has recently been ratified by both uh, the EU and Canada and this puts uh, an end to the uh, non-binding uh, memorandum of understanding which uh, applied so far. Now, uh, one thing to, uh, to observe is that there is a variety of, uh, uh, of effects uh, on company. There are different type of effects that need to be uh, taken into consideration. I have uh, uh, distinguished uh, as main effects types, uh, two uh, types of effects uh, for Canadian uh, uh, trade. Um, first of all, there is the effect uh, for Canadian trade to the UK for onward export to the EU or vice versa, which will become uh, more, uh, more, more complicated um, uh, as of uh, today, one could say. And the second uh, type of effects is a, a type of effects which applies um, regardless of whether there is an onward trade from the UK to uh, the EU. This applies also uh, so without, without onward trade. Now, to start uh, to address uh, first, uh, the first type of uh, effects, um, uh, these are relatively easy to quantify. Uh, they consist mainly of non-tariff barriers to trade uh, and they result in uh, increased bureaucracy due to the split off uh, of Britain from the EU customs territory. Uh, uh, the 
uh, agreement concluded uh, between the UK and Canada and between the UK and the EU have prevented tariffs from being imposed right away. But the cost of extra paperwork, uh, VAT and handling charges, um, the, the, the increase uh, could not be uh, prevented. And then there is also uh, the possible costs resulting from uh, new uh, from new rules of origin. Uh, these are new requirements. The rules are complicated and burdensome, uh, especially for uh, small uh, companies. Uh, and they may even prefer to uh, pay tariffs rather than uh, do the required paperwork. Uh, and furthermore, uh, supply change, uh, supply chains may have to be changed to meet uh, to meet the rules of origin. Um, onshoring is a term. Uh, Onshoring may have to be considered, uh, namely moving part uh, of the production uh, process to the UK or the EU. Uh, So-called diagonal uh, accumulation uh, for the purposes of determining origin is not allowed. Uh, with that term is meant including goods uh, originating in countries with which both the UK and the EU have a free trade agreement and including those goods also for uh, the determination of origin. So this is a first type of effects. Uh, it will be uh, more complicated uh, to trade uh, from Canada to the UK and then with onward exports to the uh, EU and that might affect companies uh, in a negative way. The second type of effects of Brexit, uh, uh, which is uh, more diffuse and uh, more difficult to quantify also because uh, they are company uh, specific, are the effects on Canadian businesses um, that uh, trade uh, to the UK uh, or to the EU uh, without any uh, onward uh, export also. So especially uh, implications of uh, legislative differentiation between the uh, European Union uh, and the UK so uh, legislative uh, divergence may make it uh, much more expensive for third country firms, including uh, Canada, to comply with both sets of rules. Uh, think only, uh, for instance, of the requirements about labeling. Um, also, it is possible that uh, the uh, UK's social and, and environmental standards may be lowered. Uh, and uh, then in case there is a significant effect uh, on, uh, on, on the EU, then tariffs and uh, countermeasures may be applied. So with regard to what's called a level playing field uh, and uh, sustainability, uh, that chapter uh, of the TCA, there is a, a new rebalancing system which is uh, foreseen. And for that reason, because uh, it, makes, uh, it makes the application of, uh, of uh, countermeasures, of, of tariffs much more difficult, the, UK uh, EU TCA has been called a, a treaty for divergence. Uh, also within this uh, uh, second type of effects, uh, one should mention the uncertainty which is involved in uh, state aids or subsidies. State state aids uh, are uh, permitted, of course, under the uh, uh, UK EU uh, trade and cooperation agreement and this may uh, affect uh, Canadian companies uh, as well as uh, British ones. The system in the UK is not yet uh, up and running 
but um, if such aids or, uh, or advantages have a significant uh, negative impact on the EU, uh, tariffs may be inflicted, uh, vice versa, it's also true. So uh, I, I note in this regard uh, that there is no uh, obligation of, re uh, of restitution of the aid or the fiscal advantage a company has received, but there is uh, still uh, a lot of uncertainty in this case. Now, last point which I would like to address is a, a brief look into the future, a little bit of crystal ball. Uh, what are the uh, prospects for uh, Canada's future uh, bilateral trade relations with the EU and the UK? I have uh, three short propositions here. Um, now, CETA, as we all know, is being provisionally applied since three years now. It is beneficial to Canada. And uh, from what I, uh, I see, uh, I think that Canada does not seem to be uh, eager to uh, change or to amend uh, CETA. Uh, and this is so even if we can foresee that the company that companies may lose out somewhat in the future of Brexit. Um, by contrast, uh, Canada and the UK uh, may want to conclude uh, another agreement, I mean uh, a less uh, ad hoc agreement than the uh, temporary uh, UK-Canada trade continuity agreement it has now. There are many issues that, uh, that could be uh, concluded and which are not uh, included in great detail right now. Uh, one may think of geographical indications, uh, uh, investor state dispute settlement, uh, financial uh, services. Uh, what else? Uh, uh, Canada may uh, possibly uh, want to see first how the relations between uh, uh, the UK and the EU will develop as regards uh, the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU. <clears throat> This is now provisionally applied and the Partnership Council has not yet been established. Uh, the, uh, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement may, seems to be the appropriate framework to work out an agreement, a specific agreement on subsidies. And this would definitely fit into the new trade strategy of the EU that was recently adopted by the uh, European Commission. There's a, 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 I can't see what it is. It probably said two minutes. Okay, well, I can do, I can do better than that. Uh, there is a, a recent uh, House of Lords Select Committee uh, report that came out just, uh, just yesterday or the day before, and which contains, uh, which mentions a number of areas where uh, progress uh, could be made. Um, between the UK and uh, Canada and should be made in the foreseeable future. Uh, the uh, UK uh, the Select Committee uh, uh, recommends that the issue of diagonal origin determination, which I just mentioned, uh, would be on the negotiating table, aviation uh, and uh, transport. And this may also help uh, to help the UK to keep its uh, trading position and to limit trade disputes. I'll, I'll keep it there and leave some time for questions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nanette. Uh, and we'll move to the final panelist, uh, Xenia, that will uh, discuss about UNCITRAL, Investment Arbitration Reform Lessons from CETA. Thank you very much uh, for this wonderful event and I, uh, all the presentations by previous panels have been extremely insightful to, to me as well. Uh, so it's a beautiful uh, morning, rainy morning in Ottawa indeed to, to speak about CETA, what could be a better time to do it. Uh, so uh, I will speak about uh, ancestral investment arbitration reform and specifically uh, lessons from, from CETA in the context of investor state and dispute settlement. 
so there are a couple of uh, points that I'd like to make that many of the participants in this uh, workshop probably already familiar with, specifically that investor state arbitration uh, has invoked quite a bit of criticism all over Europe, but also in Canada. So it has been quite a hot topic uh, that generated this phenomenon of uh, backlash against investor state arbitration. This is obviously just a sample example from, from The Economist from 2014. But uh, if you Google um, ISDS CETA, um, um, you will probably get uh, lots of uh, funny images uh, that I cannot uh, really display during this presentation uh, for copyright reasons. Uh, so, but I strongly recommend you to take a look at it. Um, so, as we all understand that the backlash predominantly focused on uh, certain issues such as contradictory decisions uh, that investor state arbitration panels generate, uh, great uncertainty, uh, but also in addition to it, um, multiple frivolous claims have been a concern. So um, I would like to um, speak about CETA's attempt to actually respond to those concerns and then transition to um, ancestral arbitration reform and discuss how exactly CETA's <clears throat> achievements and uh, uh, coverage of certain issues uh, is displayed during the negotiations uh, under ancestral currently. So, um, and I'll focus, uh, I cannot unfortunately focus on all aspects of the negotiations and, and CETA, such as, for example, third party funding and many other important issues. So, I selected three points of focus that is mediation, um, appellate body, and the appointments and frivolous claims. Those are really three, one of the three core issues that trouble the negotiating governments and the ancestral um, working group three, that's where the reform predominantly is conducted and all the expertise really resides. Um, so uh, I will focus on those three aspects again in the context of CETA and ancestral arbitration reform. Um, and with respect to CETA, I would like to uh, note that uh, CETA actually uh, provides for the opportunities uh, for mediation under the agreement of uh, both governments. And uh, really, uh, mediation provision in Article uh, 8.20 uh, is in place to uh, facilitate the prevention of disputes and really improve efficiency of ISDS and provide for some flexibility for the government to actually resolve the disputes without resorting necessarily to investor state dispute settlement. We, of course, don't have any provision that would provide for, let's say, mandatory uh, arbitration, but it has been extensively discussed in the literature. Uh, most recent um, volume on mediation and international arbitration by Catherine uh, Titi. Um, and um, uh, Katia Gomez that was published with Oxford University Press actually invites us to consider possibility of mandatory mediation uh, for particular types of disputes. Uh, and of course, there are corresponding uh, disadvantages of such an approach. So CETA does not really provide, of course, for mandatory mediation, but uh, only for mediation uh, by the agreement of both parties. Um, and I think that the procedure of mediation is quite useful to really facilitate the resolution of uh, potential resolution of uh, disputes. So uh, CEDA, as we all well know, provides also for this standing appellate body opportunity and also provides for uh, some diversity provisions uh, with respect to the appointments specifically the possibility to appoint a third party uh, arbitrator, so nationals not of the European Union and uh, Canadian nationals, which I thought was a definitely a step forward to respond to the diversity concerns, particular geographical diversity concerns uh, that were raised in the context of uh, investor state arbitration reform. Um, and uh, CETA actually envisions a possibility of establishment of the multilateral investment court um, and the generally cooperation that Canada and the European Union uh, should undertake with possibly other trading and investment partners. And that in fact happens uh, in the context of uh, um, the uh, ANSA trial uh, working group three work currently. So I thought that in this sense, uh, of course, many commentators criticize CETA for not fully going forward and responding to the backlash. But in my view, it's actually quite forward looking agreement in many aspects, in particular with respect to the establishment of the appellate body that remains actually on the table um, at, at the ancestral 
working group three and specifically uh, remains on the table as one of the um, core approaches uh, to, to the potential reform of investor state dispute settlement. Um, with respect to the diversity concern, even though CETA provides for an opportunity to appoint uh, third party nationals, it doesn't actually go so far on gender issues, which I thought, um, um, and I will refer to uh, Ambassador uh, Campbell's uh, uh, notes with respect to the, the point that uh, CETA should not stay, stand still and there's quite possibility for, for involvement of the agreement. So that is point, um, particularly on gender diversity in the arbitral um, or adjudicatory appointment, appointments that actually can be quite important to address um, in potentially in further um, renegotiations, amendments or arrangements that pertain to, to CETA. Uh, so, uh, one of the most important aspects of CETA that I thought um, um, is quite useful that CETA addresses that, so it provides specifically for the mechanisms for dismissal of frivolous claims, and frivolous claims have been a significant matter of concern um, of the UNCITRAL Working Group 3, and specifically CETA actually provides for two mechanisms. It's the mechanism for dismissal of claims manifestly without legal merit, uh, and here CETA actually borrows from the practice of uh, exit, and specifically exit arbitration rules provide for uh, the, uh, the mechanism for dismissal of manifestly, claims manifestly without legal merit, and also provides for uh, the dismissal of claims unfounded as a matter of law. Practically speaking, the claims unfounded as a matter of law is uh, those claims in which an award in favor of claimant cannot be made. Uh, so uh, here I would like to note that there is a, a, a quite a bit of a contradiction with respect to interpretation of claims unfounded as a matter of law. Uh, Ranko case would be a, a wonderful case to look at to um, understand the particulars of interpretation. Uh, th th there's obviously something very important that CETA does um, uh, with respect to those two mechanisms, and that is that it combines these mechanisms also with the creation of the appellate body that would potentially uh, make the arbitral practice more consistent. Of course, it is e easier, in my view, to dismiss uh, the so-called frivolous claims or claims manif claim manifestly without legal merit or unfounded claim if the participating governments uh, and investors and arbitrators actually know what the law is. So it seems to be quite intuitive, but uh, I think that in this sense, CETA provides for an important innovation because ultimately uh, the mechanism for, claims, for dismissal of claims manifested without legal merit, it already has existed under exit for quite some time. Uh, and claims, uh, the mechanism for dismissal of claims unfounded as a matter of law, you can see it in many of uh, the uh, agreements by the United States uh, model, US uh, BIT as well. Um, uh, and uh, that is since the, the Methanex case. So uh, let me now briefly discuss, mindful of time, briefly discuss uh, the ancestral uh, reform uh, by the working group three. So it's interesting that, uh, as I mentioned before, CETA, in my view, is a very forth, uh, coming and forward-looking agreement, really, because many issues that CETA tried to tackle, Working Group 3 also addresses, and it's maybe because Canada and the European Union both remain quite active participants of the Working Group 3. So ultimately, uh, if we we'll take a look at, at the agenda, it's very expansive. So again, I'm focusing on the uh, attempts to improve dispute prevention mechanisms, appellate body, and uh, considerations of the possibility to create multi multilateral investment courts, uh, issues with appointments, and particularly the diversity of appointments and frivolous claims. Uh, so. If we take a look at uh, appointments and um, at, at the, uh, first of all, uh, dispute prevention mechanisms, so there is a general concern that uh, it is important to facilitate uh, dispute prevention to provide for uh, effective cost allocation in the dispute resolution process. And I think CETA did that, provided for opportunity of mediation, but there are quite a bit of uh, um, thinks that uh, both European Union and Canada, perhaps in the context of the work of Working Group 3, thank you, Trina, uh, or the Working Group 3, 
need to think about and this potential of mediation in the context of uh, uh, specific sectoral disputes in my view such as for example intellectual property or even in the context of uh, the potential framework for addressing artificial intelligence that ambassador campbell referenced um, so uh, my my second point is on selection and appointment methods and i think that uh, uh, here, Answer 12 Working Group 3 actually referenced CETA in considering uh, what can be um, the best uh, ways to structure the appointments um, and, for example, to provide for permanent appellate body composed of a fixed number of members uh, sort of following or echoing uh, CETA's approach. Uh, but what's interesting is that Ultimately, the working group three actually pays attention to the diversity criteria, including gender criteria, and not only to geographical diversity. And again, again I, I do believe that it would be quite useful for both the European Union and Canada to focus on gender appointments specifically in the ISDS context. I have been uh, uh, quite uh, pushy about this very matter in my, in my own uh, publications. Uh, and again, uh, working group three, just to sum it up, addresses the uh, mechanism for early dismissal of frivolous claims. Unfortunately, there is no really agreement among the memberships what really constitutes uh, frivolous claims. How can be they distinguish from fully unmeritorious? So there's quite a bit of terminology hustle. Uh, but I think that in this sense, CETA can be a useful example, since CETA is one of, the, one of the few agreements that actually provides for both the mechanisms for dismissal of claims, but also for the appellate uh, body for ensuring the consistency of uh, interpretation. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Xenia. Uh, thank you all the panelists. Uh, you provided lots of food for thought. Um, we have some time for questions. I will take the liberty of stealing from the break a little bit if uh, we have a discussion here. Uh, so again, you can ask your questions by chat or just raise your digital hand if you would like to uh, ask directly uh, one of the panelists uh, a, a question. I have noted two from the chat up to now. Uh, one is for Michelle. Um, and uh, the question is, uh, what are the priority areas identified in regulatory cooperation? And uh, how different is the CETA regulatory cooperation from that in North American context? Um, and I'll give you a, a second, Michelle, to think about until uh, I pose the question to Valerie. Uh, there is a question for Valerie. Is there, are there linkages between foreign direct investment screening and public procurement bids, um, especially in key sectors? Um, for example, are there any national security obligations to exclude procurement under CETA? Um, so these are the, the two questions that were posed by Chad, by Michelle. So, Michelle can, Michelle, can you provide any um, thoughts on your question? Um, yeah, so, so I'm sorry, I just didn't hear the, the beginning of the question. I hope that I answer it well um, about the difference between North America and, and uh, the CETA in terms and, of regulatory cooperation. Yeah. And I don't priority know. areas identified in regulatory cooperation. Priority okay. areas, yeah. Okay, and uh, uh, there was another question after or? No, that's no, all that's for you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, I, 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 I want to be brief because I know there is a lot of questions and there's not much time. So uh, I would say that in terms of the main differences that I see, uh, when I talked about precautionism, pre uh, you know, this is an, uh, a regulatory approach, you know, that we are going to uh, be proactive, um, ex ante, uh, taking measure of regulation in terms of what could be like threats or you know um, uh, any measures that you know uh, is going to be in the interest of, of the general public. 
uh, in terms of objectives, you know, of public policy, for instance, uh, whereas that, uh, you know, in the uh, in North America, uh, you know, basically mostly because of the United States, we have a more science based, you have to prove that there is a threat before there is a regulation. And if the regulation is, uh, uh, has to be justified in terms of uh, facts, you know, so um, it's not a very precautionary <laughs> uh, regulatory approach. So there is a bridge to be made. I mean, it's a, a debate that has been uh, going on for 25 years. In terms of the um, the the, the um, the priority in terms of the CETA, uh, you know, a lot of, of, of you have been talking about, you know, the geographic uh, indicators. I think that uh, there is a regulatory cooperation that is very important that could uh, make it uh, very um, uh, pertinent in terms of, uh, well, the, the, the localization, you know, in terms of, you know, in, in the economy that is so globalized, what is the rule of origin? What is the, you know, the, the, the local imprint of of a, of a of a good, especially in the pandemics, you know, we're going back to uh, you know geographic localization issues. So, um, and I think it's also uh, you know in terms of a regulatory cooperation, how do we define uh, you know a service that is localized, especially in the digital era? You know, some con some companies are entering our market access or our market without even having to ask an entry. You know, uh, and and they're 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 benefiting from um, from asymmetric regulation. These are, I think, the issues that are very complex and very urgent in terms of uh, of the CETA, especially when they deal with the U.S. Uh, digital uh, giant, you know, big tech of the U.S. Um, so um, I would think that that's you know, and 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 of course climate change, you know, the, the regulation uh, that uh, is exactly, is it going to be like a patching word or is it going to be a, a, a proactive? I think that uh, this is like one of the big priority. So I will stop there. Sorry to be so long. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Valerie? Okay, uh, thanks so much for the question. So in terms of the first part of the question, are there linkages between uh, FDI foreign direct investment screening and public procurement bids. Um, I can't speak with a great deal of certainty to that, but to the second part of the question that might indirectly help with that. Um, are there national security obligations that limit the kinds of uh, procurement tenders that can be put forward and the bids that come in? Yes, this is true for CETA and this is true for all of um, all of Canada's trade agreements. There's uh, what's called NSEs, national security exemptions, and that allow um, Canadian authorities to basically exclude procurement from some or all of the obligations of, of CETA or the relevant trade agreement at hand. So there is, um, there is language and a provision for that outlined within chapter 19 of the CETA agreement. The, um, uh, most of that will likely be more applicable to the federal level where perhaps there's the most obvious large scale spending on, say, elements of defense, military, um, all of those things. But it, it, is, it, it is a very thoughtful and a timely question going forward when you think about how our conceptions of national security have potentially evolved in response to the pandemic, you know, whereas, say, in more in generations past, national security spoke first and foremost to intelligence and uh, defense. Now we're very much, uh, borders have been reconceptualized quite rapidly in the past year in terms of um, national security also being the case of being able to provide PPE, of being able to have adequate um, hospitals and medical space, uh, access to vaccines as well. And so the areas of you know, provincial or municipal spending in terms of vaccine access or upgrades to hospitals, uh, schools, et cetera, for regular cleaning and safety, all of these things will have relevance as well. This is something I can't I, I can't say with assuredness, but for for many procurement tenders, um, if they are going to invoke an NSC, a national security exemption, uh, the obligations of a treaty are such that that those ought to be put forth in the initial call. Uh, so essentially specifying that um, uh, 
you know, using the language of the national security exemption when that is put forward. Does that happen all the time? That's a great question. Probably not. But as we've seen with many things, uh, not just with CETA, but with various other Canadian international trade agreements, uh, the, 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 the element of figuring out precedence and in putting and translating you know, paper to application sometimes takes place in the follow-up. Uh, so not necessarily in background oversight monitoring, but in the elements of, um, of the businesses and individuals actually bringing complaints and cases forward. So, well, welcome, Eleanor, Mark, uh, Delphine. Uh, now I'm also looking for uh, Geneviève, who is... Oui, bonjour. Uh, bonjour, Geneviève. <laughs> Alors, okay, so I'm just trying to get everyone uh, on my screen. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for this uh, second panel uh, of today's conference. Uh, we already had... Uh, a great panel on um, by the academics. So now we have the practitioners, in a way, the, the business government perspective uh, on CETA. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have with us um, four great panelists. So I'll take them in order of um, uh, alphabetical order. So first we have uh, Mark Agnew, who is the Vice President Policy and International at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Second, uh, we have Geneviève Goujon, uh, who comes to us uh, from Global Affairs Canada. She is the Deputy Director of the Trade Commissioner Service Division and uh, is responsible for the promotion of, of uh, free trade agreements, one of them uh, being CETA. Uh, we have uh, Eleonora Catella, who comes to us from uh, Business uh, Europe. She is the international relations, um, uh, from the International Relations Department. So uh, providing uh, the, the, the European business perspective. And finally, we have uh, Delphine Salar, uh, who comes to us from the EU delegation here in, uh, in Ottawa. And uh, she is the trade and uh, the, the the chief of the trade and economic affairs section at the delegation. So welcome uh, to all of you. Um, so what I thought we would do in terms of uh, the presentations, uh, we would first start with the business perspective. So I would ask Mark uh, maybe to go first, provide uh, the Canadian business perspective on CETA and, and, and the, 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 where it's, it's, it's gone and where it's going or where it should go. Uh, and then I'll ask uh, Eleonora to, uh, to give us uh, the European perspective. So the, the, the counterpart to, to Marx. And then we'll have uh, Geneviève and, and fin uh, finally, but none the least, uh, Delphine uh, will provide us more the government perspective. Uh, from uh, the, uh, the the European uh, Union and Geneviève, obviously from uh, the, the uh, government of Canada. So, Mark, uh, the uh, the screen is yours. All right. Well, thanks, Patrick, for the invitation, and it's great to uh, both uh, see some familiar faces as well as uh, some some names uh, around the, the virtual room of uh, folks that we will, as we like to say, we'll hopefully all be able to meet again in person before not too long. Um, I mean, I think the perspective from our members is that CETA has been working quite well. Um, not perfect, but, you know, nothing is in life. And so actually what I wanted to spend my time uh, talking about was a little bit more of where we think we need to build on what we have and what sort of forward looking agenda is rather than sort of just being uh, retrospective uh, about it. So um, I'm going to go through a couple of things in no particular order and then uh, look forward to the, the Q&A portion afterwards. So I think firstly, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about agriculture. Um, and a lot of our you know, members are watching with much, much interest the European Green, uh, Green Deal, the farm to fork strategy, and you know, what all of that will mean for the agriculture you know, industry. Um, and you know, let's call a spade a spade. Um, the you know, Canadian agriculture community certainly has a different perspective than um, you know, those, those in Europe. And we're hoping that CETA can be a bridge to help um, help uh you know have a, a science and evidence-based discussion in a you know dispassionate way uh, about it i mean we know agriculture is very political in in all jurisdictions around uh, around the world some of the things that um we're hoping to see advanced on the agriculture side include 
um, you know, the implementation of a technical working group on crop protection products. And this would hopefully bring together the PMRA in Canada and the Food Safety Authority in the EU to think about how we can deal with MRL, you know, misalignments and, you know, joint reviews uh, as a way to kind of facilitate, you know, a dialogue between the regulators to, you know, get through some of these, uh, some of these challenges. Um, also challenges around things like low level presence response protocols. And again, what can the do two jurisdictions do together to help uh, overcome these? Because there's a lot of trust that needs to be built between regulators and that takes time to do. Um, it's not about browbeating or anything like that, but how can we have the, the two sort of governments and industries come together to again, have an evidence-based uh, you know, discussion to, to move forward. One of the other forums that's been uh, moving along and continuing to have its uh, regular cadence of meetings is the Regulatory Cooperation Forum. And I think it's been good to see a number of forward-looking items um, in that, whereas some of the other CETA institutional structures are looking more at what I would call current irritants. So I think it is good to have that differentiation and not let the forward stuff get bogged down by um, sort of the, 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 the institutional and then legacy issues. One of the things that um, I, I would say about the regulatory cooperation, you know, process, and this also goes for um, what happens in the CETA institutional committees, is that you know it's been good to see the the readouts published on the Global Affairs Canada website, and we really do support that. One of the things that you know we've been um, asking the government to do is create a single dashboard of what are all the issues that are out there for stakeholders to be able to see. You know, what are kind of the regulatory differences? Uh, some people might call them irritants, some people call them market access barriers, but whatever it is, let's get those, you know, together in, in one place. It could probably be mutually agreed between the Commission and Global Affairs Canada. And I think that will enhance uh, not only just, you know, transparency for transparency's sake, which is, you know, important in any, you know, liberal democracy, but it also will enhance stakeholder engagement so that people can see where the issues are, are at. Um, on the services side, uh, one of the things that's been underutilized in CETA is the mutual recognition of professional qualifications. And what can we do to get that, uh, you know, more widely rolled out to different professional bodies? I know there's challenges in terms of subnational governments, particularly in, in Canada and being able to have some coherence, but that's something that we would hope to see a bit more work on going forward. Um, with respect to procurement, we think there's also some opportunities around um, how governments go about procurement practices and so more information sharing around what you hear a lot of people calling value based healthcare procurement and that's around encouraging authorities to not look at pure cost numbers when bidding, sorry, when assessing the bids about the efficacy of certain medical technologies, but how can we actually work to um, have outcome-based assessments uh, for these things and that be a, a very prominent tool. Digital economy issues, which I know Patrick is near to your heart and a lot of research that you've done. Certainly the, you know, the adequacy um, decisions are quite important for Canadian businesses, cross-border data flows, and being able to ensure that, you know, Canada maintains its adequacy, st adequacy status. And then the discussions we have on these digital issues will then have a broader read across to what's happening at the global level at the WTO and in uh, in other forums. Um, the last thing that I'll just say a word about is trade and environment. And there's been a lot of discussions recently on carbon border adjustments. And this includes both how do you have potentially taxes imposed on goods coming into countries, as well as um, uh, so potentially even export credits for goods that are being exported to jurisdictions that have lower carbon prices. This is a really, really messy subject. Um, if you have integrated supply chains, it's very, very complicated in a Canada-US context, let alone a Canada-EU trade context. There are a lot of legitimate questions around the WTO commitments aspect and um, you know, how would a carbon water adjustment work with GATT uh, obligations? And even too, in the case of Canada, we have different carbon prices across the country, depending on which province you're in, or are you subject to the federal floor? And that would also potentially have challenges from a rules of origin perspective. Um, you know, rules of origin is done on a country basis. We don't look at subnational jurisdictions. And so if there's a higher carbon price in, you know, BC versus Ontario, how does that affect carbon border adjustment if there's then integrated supply chains? And so our view on carbon border adjustments is that it is premature to just, you know, rush into these things because they could have very real implications for companies and what we think both you know, the European Commission and the member states and you know, the Canadian government and the provinces should be doing is looking at the sort of evidence and you know, 
having some joint analysis about how carbon border adjustments would actually work in practice. Um, let's not get sort of ahead of ourselves and let the euphoria, um, you know, drive decisions that could be quite ill-advised for companies. And so there's a way, I think, to leverage the CETA as a platform um, to have the governments uh, come together on that. And, you know, whether it's the CETA or strategic partnership agreement, you know, let's not get hung up on which agreement it is. But I think there definitely is a need for the two sides uh, to be speaking to each other. So I'm actually going to stop there, Patrick, um, and look forward to getting into the discussion uh, with others later. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. I think you've you've really nicely set up the table for a, a number of issues, obviously, that uh, are of, of great interest uh, to, to business and governments on, on, on both sides of, of the Atlantic and, and certainly with respect to CETA. So thank you for, so much for that. Eleonora, please. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning I'm in Canada. And thanks for inviting me. Indeed, I will provide a bit of a um, counterpart views uh, to, to what Mark has just said and, and give the perspective of some of, of the same issues that Mark uh, brought up. Um, in general, also for the European business, we have a very positive view of, of CETA. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the most progressive trade agreements that, uh, that uh, the US negotiated and concluded, which is, as Canada knows very well, is not the same thing. And um, we are happy that it covers all aspects of the bilateral um, trade and investment relationship, but also we are particularly happy with the fact that it has brought the bilateral relationship to the to a next uh, level. So it allows us to discuss a lot of important issues uh, um, uh, of, of our time, like climate change, energy, migration, data flows, as uh, Mark mentioned. Um, so what I would like to talk about is first a bit the, the results of the agreement. Uh, so the positive aspects. Second, uh, where we can still make progress because uh, um, maybe we can do better on, uh, in, in some areas. And then I would like to look uh, even further uh, at what uh, other opportunities uh, CETA opens up for uh, the UN Canada to cooperate uh, on that are particularly important for our, for our members. So in terms of uh, uh, results, we are, um, we are happy that um, there has been a growth in, in trade, both trading goods and trading services, um, especially up until the pandemic. Uh, then, of course, we are just a bit at the beginning of 2021 and the statistics are uh, available uh, in full for 2019. And then, of course, uh, with the pandemic, uh, the situation complicated in, in, uh, in, in 2020. But what we could see up until uh, the pandemic is, uh, is an increase in trade and, uh, and uh, both in services and goods. So we have, uh, I think, 25% in goods and almost 47%, if I'm not so mistaken, on, on services. In services, we went from uh, 28,000 million uh, euros in 2017 to more than 35,000 million in 2019. Um, and then, as I said, we had the pandemic, but still, even with the heavy disruption of trade and the regular supplies, uh, of course, because uh, one year uh, ago, at the start of the outbreak, we had, of course, the transport restrictions. So also, uh, some goods are transported uh, with the passenger flights. So, so if those don't go, the goods don't go. Um, and then also the necessary quarantine and uh, the, all, all what, what was needed. Of course, we have seen disruption in trades and, and supplies, but even so, uh, between you and Canada, uh, there was a better situation than what you had with other countries. So we were still uh, at a situation with 15% higher than pre-CETA um, times and before the provisional entry into force of the agreement. So the lesson learned is that CETA provided uh, um, an anchor of stability and even without the, 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 the crisis created by, by COVID, it was not easy times for the international trade because we had uh, protectionist trends, unilateral trends. So we really need agreements like, uh, like CETA. We would like to have more of that. And we need to um, tell more that they, they, they bring about positive stories and we need to do um, two things. We need to still communicate uh, to companies and uh, raise awareness among our companies about uh, the, 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 the fact that CETA is there, so they have new opportunities, new rules apply that might be extreme, extremely interesting for them. 
So it's, uh, it's something that we are still in the process of learning, um, especially three and a half years ago when CETA entered into force, uh, um, we were not yet used, uh, we didn't have all the instruments that we have developed in the meantime. And I have to praise the European Commission here because they have done quite a lot. They have uh, used uh, umbrella organizations like ours, they have used the delegations in member states to really have the information trickle down to the level of companies, especially, especially the small ones, to make sure they were aware, were aware of CETA and the opportunities. They have developed guides uh, in, uh, in different languages uh, on different sectors uh, um, on, on uh, how to find business partners and so on, and this has proven extremely useful. And we, I know that also Global Affairs Canada has done a lot on, uh, on the Canadian side, so we can learn from each other what has worked, what we can use uh, also for other trade agreements. And the need to tell positive stories, because uh, as you know, um, not all member states have ratified on the, on the EU side. And um, well, Canada is not the first one that sees this. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm from Italy. Italy was the last country to ratify the agreement with Korea, and it happened four and a half years after the provisional entry into force. And of course, this is frustrating for all of us, but at the same time, we have to look at the, at the context, and maybe we don't want to put uh, the, the agreement to be put up for ratification before the positive stories have come out, because they can really be instrumental in encouraging and increases the chances for ratification. And we don't want definitely the agreement to fall victim of uh, um, domestic politics, uh, uh, other uh, narratives that are uh, uh, not favorable to trade agreements when in fact they help businesses and especially the small and medium sized ones. But of course, to, in, to have these positive stories to encourage ratification, we need to make sure that, uh, um, that the implementation is going smoothly. And this is also why the second point of my intervention is uh, um, what can we do better? Where, where can we have uh, um, improvements? One of these uh, things that I, that I wanted to mention has been mentioned also by Mark, the mutual uh, recognition agreement of professional qualifications, for example, for architects. Um, I can also think of uh, transparency on temporary entry provisions. I can think of application of geographical indications. Geographical indications, uh, um, these are particularly important for some of the states uh, that have not yet uh, ratified um, the agreement. Uh, so we know that we, we have learned there have been reports of misuse of uh, certain food names uh, um, that are subject to GI protection. And um, so we could do better there. And uh, third point, the, the, the opportunities to cooperate. Uh, between you and Canada that, uh, um, that are on issues that are of, co of common interest and where CETA really puts us on, on a different level. So um, also Mark has mentioned the trade and environment. This is also something where we can have an initiative at the WTO uh, level. Canada is, uh, is at the heart of the Ottawa group, of course, and uh, uh, this is it's really instrumental to discuss uh, proposals to support the multilateral trading system and uh, as business we definitely support that and we need to use um, these initiatives to, to discuss things like trade and environment, um, subsidies as well, um, all, all things related to, to subsidies like uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, te technology transfers and, uh, and so on. And we need to exchange uh, uh, information. We need to, uh, to come up with proposals. We need to work together. And uh, so the commission has put forward the trade policy review. We are also waiting for legislative initiatives uh, on, uh, for example, on uh, based on the Green Deal um, uh, uh, in the next, in the next uh, months. But as, as private sector, we would like also to, to, to to, of course, to contribute to this. So we are looking into the trade policy review, seeing the proposals there, and we are actively participating in the mechanisms that CETA has set up for private uh, sector engagement, for civil society organizations engagement on issues like um, environment, for example. There is the domestic advisory group, and Canada has two, one on labor, one on environment. We, as business group, are a member of the European Domestic Advisory Group that is discussing these issues. 
and have a huge impact on, on policy. They could have a huge impact on policy. So we have to make sure that also the economic dimension is taken into account to really ensure that, uh, um, uh, that we have a, a, a sustainable development. So we, we, we hope to, to, to have more exchanges in this group also together with uh, the uh, uh, Canadian business and uh, to work together with, uh, with, all, uh, with all parties on this. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Eleonora. Um, this was, uh, again, uh, excellent uh, to have, in a way, a complementary uh, perspective. And certainly uh, what, uh, what, what we get from the Marks and Eleonora's pres presentations is that uh, business uh, is very positive uh, and, and think that uh, CETA is, 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 has been a success so far but certainly uh, more work can be done. And certainly when it comes to new challenges, as uh, Eleonora just mentioned, issues around the environment, uh, Mark uh, talked about uh, digital issues. So, uh, but, you know, I, again, I think uh, as Eleonora mentioned during the pandemic, uh, CETA as, as, as was a vehicle uh, that allowed in a way greater cooperation and stability uh, then, and, and we can wonder whether if it had not been there, would, would relations and trade relations or economic relations between uh, the EU and Canada have been as, as, as good, uh, given obviously the, the dire circumstances in which we were operating. So I'll now turn to uh, Geneviève. Uh, I should mention, and I forgot to mention it, uh, that on the program, um, Cindy Eve Bourassa, uh, who is Geneviève's colleague, was uh, slated to, uh, to appear uh, to be on this panel. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she was unavailable. I think she has to brief a minister today. Uh, so Geneviève uh, kindly accepted uh, to, to take her place. Uh, so uh, thank you, Geneviève. And uh, the screen is yours. So it's about uh, promoting CETA to Canadian businesses through the TCS. So I, I thought it's important to go back. The TCS, what is this? Direct Commissioner Service, right? We've been uh, here for 100, 125 years. And um, what we do is we provide Canadian businesses that we call our clients with uh, on the ground intel, contacts, problem solving, uh, and services they need to succeed in foreign market. We work with export ready businesses that represents a challenge also sometimes because we have to work closely uh, with our provincial partners and, and other organizations on the ground that that do export prep. So we take the business when they're export ready at some point, okay? Um, we have 116 locations around the world, more than uh, 1,300 uh, trade commissioners uh, that are specialized in various se sectors. Um, and since COVID a year ago, we switched to virtual events, webinar, virtual trade mission. And actually, Cindy, Eve, she's speaking to the minister because on Monday, we have a major virtual trade mission with France uh, with 300 participants that are going to do B2B. So it's, uh, it, we just had one with Korea. And it's just going to grow because it's working really, really well. Um, so what we do with the TCS is we provide funding also. Can export is our, our, our key funding, especially for SMEs, the can export SME. It provides up to $75,000 for international market opportunities. Okay, so SMEs can apply and they can reapply and we've loosened the, the, the conditions a little bit. They can even apply to develop like a, an e-commerce online strategy to penetrate markets. One other uh, key uh, business support activity is the CTA, the Canadian Technology Accelerator. So these, you have to apply for these um, and it's uh, mentoring and it's uh, introduction, introduction to key partners on the ground. So these are located around the world, but in Europe, we have three, one in Munich, one in Berlin and one in London. Uh, and they are growing because it's, uh, you know what an accelerator is. Of course, I don't have to explain to you what, what, what it does. Uh, but I would say that for SMEs, uh, those are the, the two key uh, programs and activities plus the trade missions uh, that, that we do. So this is a bit intense, but I just wanted to explain to you like, the FTA promotion is part of uh, the TCS engagement division. 
And the mandate that we have is to contribute to advance the trade diversification strategy. And um, so what, are, what is the trade diversification strategy? Well, it's diversifying uh, where and what we export and as well as who exports, right? So to put it in a simple way. And what you see here is our engagement division is free trade agreement promotion. It's also inclusive trade uh activities and trade mission and why we're together is because we leverage each other so diversify where we export so it's promoting the ftas around the world and engaging the business to take advantage of them diversifying what we export that's more uh, less us but the tcs has started offering uh related services, more tailored services to digital industries, e-commerce, intellectual property. Uh, we've integrated as part of the activities more climate finance, artificial intelligence activities, right? Diversifying who exports. Well, Canada as a whole, not just GAC, is advancing the inclusive approach to trade. And the inclusive approach to trade, you know very well because it's part of our FTAs. Uh, it, it seeks to ensure that all members of society can take advantage of the opportunities that flow from trade. So um, women, indigenous people, black and other racialized, uh, LGBTQ and youth. Why is say proactive and reactive? It's just that our mandate, we, focus, we are more proactive to promote CPTPP, CETA, CUSMA, and we are reactive in helping the other FTAs that are in force. For the women indigenous is because we have the woman, um, the uh, uh, woman start strategy and with indigenous it's also growth. So we're more, we do more activities and we have funds also that we give to the embassies for those two uh, audience. And for the, it's growing, I would say, I'm gonna remove soon reactive because for the black and other racials, LGBTQ and youth, it's really growing also. So just quickly, it's just that we collaborate. Why we, I often explain to the department that we're the middleman between trade policy, geographic, chief economist. So we try to put everything together. Before trade policy, as you know, Patrick, you were there, it was, trade policy was not speaking to the trade commissioner. So our role is to make the connection between all these guys. And we work with a lot of organization, of course, including supply trade, diver supply trade organization, as I said, because of our mandate. So um, the network, of course, I don't need to explain this concept to you, but I just wanna show you what we do is we try to uh, explain to SMEs uh, not just about CETA, but what the advantage of the FTAs with those concepts. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's not from survey, you'll see most business think that it's only about tariffs. So they need to be uh, told about also transparency, predictable rule, preferential and, and non-discrimination and what it means. So we do a lot of uh, activities showing that to them. Uh, of course, uh, promoting the 14 ratified FTAs in force and telling them that they have access to 1.5 billion consumers. So as I mentioned um, before from um, a recent survey um, in, uh, on Canadian attitudes towards international trade, it was done in February last year. It suggests that while Canadians are generally supportive of free trade, they have limited knowledge of free trade agreements. Also, another survey we did in 2019 uh, showed that most lack the knowledge on how to use the FTAs, for instance, how to meet the applicable rules of origin for their product. Um, but in the case of CETA, although, although we know that the utilization rate has been increasing over time, there's still much work to do to make business aware of the advantage. Uh, utilization rate, of course, is kind of what we use often to see is it working, right? But we know that the utilization rate for Canadian exports to the EU kind of grew. Uh, it was at 52% uh, approximately in 2018. It's at almost 57% uh, in 2020. So that's kind of a, a benchmark that, that we use. Um, so now just quickly, what do we do? So what do we do to promote the FTs? I'm kind of using the funnel approach here, TCS or mandate and, and actually FTA promotion. So we do 
technical we, we try to produce and promote technical knowledge actionable information so of course we uh, co-manage the tariff finder which is a very important tool for businesses we co-manage it with bdc and edc uh, we have a um, an internal uh, tool that's called the market potential finder um, that was developed by the chief economist and it helps to identify a market potential of a Canadian product at the HS8 level. And our trade commissioners have access to this and they even have, so if you give me your HS8, I can tell you in the EU where you have the most potential based on five different factors. We could even do a presentation on this. It's about an half hour presentation, but it also gives you who are the main supplier for your HS8 product in each of the EU country. So I'm able to use that tool, it's not a silver bullet, but with other tools to tell the client that, oh, maybe you thought you had potential in Germany, but I see here in Croatia and this country, you have huge potential because of your tariff, because of, and it's mostly based on how we compare with the US, right? So if they see their product has the three main competitor for your HS8 are EU countries, then you know you don't have the tariff advantage. But if when you see that it's US or other, so it helps the client to develop their costing strategy and also their EU penetration strategy. So in the works, of course, uh, for the tariff finder, what we're working on uh, with EDCBDC is adding a rules of origin feature. Uh, a little bit like Australia has. We're looking into it right now with TPG, our, our, our specials and trade policy, um, because that's where lies the difficulty, right? For businesses is the rules of origin. Uh, also engaging with partners. So we've conducted outreach uh, for the last, since the entry into force. Um, I think what's important to say is what we're about to launch is an email and you will all receive it. It's an email campaign to business to 300 business association and partners uh, sharing a CETA primer. So it's a two pager on CETA on how to take advantage of CETA. And we're inviting this business association to share that with their, with their clients. And for some of them we're saying, hey, we're ready to go to your chamber of commerce or whatever conference to talk about it. So for, for some that we've prioritized, okay? Uh, so I think our goal is to reach more businesses. So we thought of leveraging the business association. The other challenge that we have, I don't know how much time I have Patrick left, maybe two, three minutes. Yeah, a few minutes, yes. Okay. Um, sector focus. So, you know, we've, we kind of walk and, and jog and now we're trying to run. Um, where can we go next or uh, we have to be more sectoral sector focus so so we're building more sector specific intelligence and 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 uh, to share uh, um, you know sometimes with tariff yes but also about opportunities so it's a way to link the tariff advantage with the opportunities so in our approach we're looking at sharing more uh, sector focus se doing more sector focus events and intelligence and the last is we have a training also mandate. So our mandate, and it started with that, uh, when, CETA, uh, when C CETA came into force, we went across Canada physically to train the trade commissioners. Since then, we've done more training. Our job is to ensure that the trade commissioner, what I was saying, are aware of basics of trade policy and can help their, their clients. So um, we do it in person, we did it in person, we just did it remotely. What we're doing now is putting that training, self-paced training on the Canadian Foreign and Service Institute for Perennity, so trade commissioners can go and train. Provinces and territories have access to this training, uh, so have the crowns, corporate crown corporation. Um, one event that we're really proud of um, to celebrate uh, CETA uh, in December, in, well, we did it in December, and some of you were part of that event or attend. I think, Patrick, I don't know if you were there, but some of you, uh, we collaborate with Dr. Bexmuller also on that. We had a CETA business summit with the minister over three days. Um, there were more than 1,000 individuals who participate, but seven can, like I've never had that, had that in an in-person event, 770 Canadian businesses. Some were clients, some were not. Uh, we did a really thorough follow-up 
uh, after to engage with those businesses, giving them the information, linking them to trade commissioners. And we had like a day that was uh, for thematic session, like horizontal issues, like funding, service insurance, government procurement, claiming, how do you claim preferential tariff? Logistic and custom information, e-commerce implication in the EU, uh, and also session for new uh, exporter. Then we had another day uh, dedicated to sectors. So a sector, uh, we had a session on uh, automotive, pharmaceutical, ICT, consumer product, agri-food and clean tech, which are kind of the six sectors that have the most uh, potential with CETA. Uh, and we also, as I mentioned, we have this uh, inclusive trade mandate. So we always do a session for uh, women-owned, uh, women-led, women-owned, uh, that was led by Ambassador Udon. Uh, so that was a, a feature event we just did. <clears throat> and then finishing up, just showing you some of the tool I mentioned, we do instruction, Eleonora mentioned related to that. We do, uh, we have videos on YouTube that really show uh, how to take advantage of the tariff, how to, uh, uh, how to get an advanced ruling, et cetera. Our internal tool at the bottom left is the market potential finder as I was telling you about. Um, and just finishing up, we always make a case of the CETA work, because if you want to engage business, you always say, you know, the CETA work, and of course, like, show the increase. But this is one thing that kind of uh, recently draws attention a lot. We, we tell them about, you know, what well, we always report on, on tariff utilization, okay? But let's look at the tariff that we're not claiming. So on average, Canadian exports under CETA were leaving 41% of potential tariff savings per year on the table. This is worth 320 million. So it's equal to roughly the value of all Canadian export of our maple syrup measure sugar to the US. So we have another stats also for NAFTA, which the loss, the unsaved, the potential tariff saving that were left out is equal to buying seven NHL hockey teams. So when I show that and I explain in what it means not to claim tariff and the last uh, saving that we have, it, it uh, frappe l'imaginaire. And those are some resources that we provide. Thank you. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Geneviève. I was thinking about those numbers. You might you might get a call uh, from Montreal because I think they're talking about building a new stadium for a baseball team. So <laughs> I might try to kind of link that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And and I think it, it's um, it it shows very much how um, which I think it, it, CETA was really a, a, a precursor. I uh, certainly on, on on the Canadian side. I, I can't speak too much necessarily to the European side, but the realization that. Um, you know, so, uh, negotiating and signing an agreement is not enough, right? Uh, that used to be a lot of the mentality, you know, we sign the agreement, it's there now, go business, take care of it, you know, it's there for you. And then realizing that, in fact, there's a lot of money left on the table and a lot of opportunities are not taken advantage, as, as Geneviève just, just mentioned. And uh, so I think it's really, it's great to see uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, Eleonora mentioned the, the work that the commission has done uh, in, in terms of supporting, promoting CETA and, 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 and working, and, and I'm sure more can be done, but I, I think it's really encouraging to see this and to see the response, uh, because just to say, you know, in a way, leaving, the, leaving it to the market, it just shows that it doesn't work. Their business and government have to work together uh, to make the most of these agreements. So uh, it's, it's really, I think that that's certainly a very positive element of the, the response afterwards to say, hey, we've negotiated, this is a great agreement, we believe in this, Let, let's now bring it, take it to the businesses and help them uh, make the most of it. And, and certainly uh, I, I commend you all for, for doing that. So Delphine, it's your turn now. So, um, Patrick, thank you very much uh, to you and, uh, and, and Karina for organizing this, uh, this conference today. It's always a pleasure uh, discussing with you trade and uh, EU-Canada relation, but I shall say that today you have really gathered an impressive uh, 
two panels of experts on, on CETA. And in fact, I don't even know what I can add uh, now. On a more uh, personal basis, it is also a great pleasure uh, for me being back in Canada, where I did my MBA uh, with uh, the Scholish uh, Business School at York University some time ago. I won't say how many, but the point there is that I remember at that time being awed by the quality of the universities and the uh, teaching in Canada. And uh, this indeed hasn't changed. It's also a great pleasure uh, being posted in, uh, with a, in, the, in the capital of a partner uh, with whom we have uh, the EU shares so much. Titles and names uh, some, sometimes are a bit misleading. I'm the head of the trade and economic section at the EU delegation, but this trade and economic section in fact cover all the community, the cooperation with Canada on all the community policies, meaning not only trade uh, and economic, but also environment, energy, digital uh, research matters. And I can say that it is really a pleasure uh, working with Canada on all these uh, matters with whom we have, uh, upon which we have extremely fruitful uh, dialogues between two like-minded uh, partners. But going back to uh, trade, the EU is a trading partner. Uh, a trading power. It's a partner, but it's also a power. While Canada is the only uh, country with an agreement with all G7 members, the EU is the world's largest uh, trader of manufactured goods and services. If you exclude trade between member states, which account for approximately 1.5% of one, one, sorry, 1 1.5 times uh, the amount of foreign trade. EU trade in goods with the rest of the world accounts for around 15% of world trade in goods. The EU is the biggest trading partner for 75 countries. By comparison, the United States is the first trading partner for just over 30 countries. And for China, it's they are the first trading partner for 66 countries. The EU is also at the heart of the most comprehensive network of trade agreements in the world. We have trade agreements with 72 countries. And trade is supporting more than 36 million jobs in the EU. So trade is at the core of the EU's uh, DNA. This is probably why CETA signed in 2016 and provisionally applied since, 20, since September 2017 is the cornerstone of EU-Canada relationship. CETA is one of the most ambitious and progressive trade agreements the EU has ever concluded. It offers companies in both the EU and Canada significant new opportunities for transatlantic trade and investment, giving EU exporters, large and small, much improved access to one of the world's most developed markets. This cooperation is built on the fact that both partners have high product standards, apply some of the highest labor and environmental standards in the world, ensure an exemplary consumer protection. So what was the, uh, the, the basis of that groundbreaking agreement? From day one of the provisional application, 98% of customs duties were removed. 
Delphine, if I, uh, if I may just interrupt you a second, would it be possible to put uh, your presentation in full screen? Because I think some, uh, it, it, it's, it shows a little bit small. I don't know if it's possible for you. It should so, be, it should be. It would make um, it easier, I think, for everyone to, to actually be able also to I, read the slides. Ah, perfect, thank you. Here we are. Is it better? <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so provisional, so removal of tariffs, 90%, 99% of tariffs on goods. 100% of tariff lines on industrial products but also new market access on, on sectors like agricultural products, transport, or financial services. CETA also provide Canadian companies an access to the EU single market, a market of 450 million consumers, one territory without any internal border or regulatory obstacle to the free movement of good services and capital. CETA has allowed 143 European products to benefit from the geographical indication protection when sold in Canada. This gives those agricultural products a similar level of protection from imitation as EU laws does and provide Canadian consumers with goods of high quality. EU and Canada has also set up a forum on regulatory cooperation that will go further in the convergence of standards. It will it has allowed European companies to respond to public tenders, not only at the federal, but also the provincial and municipal level. It will facilitate the dispatch of engineers and other specialists to provide support services. For example, we had the story of a Dutch company that has moved to Canada and where before CETA, it would cost them 5,000 euros and five months to bring over an engineer and to grow their business. It now costs them only 200 euros. And when we, when we uh, gathered that story, they told us only a few days, the uh, COVID uh, pandemic limited the movement of people in the meantime, but I'm sure that we will get back to more uh, free flow of specialists. If, so what has been the outcome of CETA? CETA is a recent agreement. It's barely three and a half years, but it has already delivered concrete positive results. Growth in EU-Canada trade shows steady, steady upward trajectory since CETA provisional application. Compared to pre-CETA baseline, total merchandise trade grew by 15% in 2018 and 25% in 2019. Export, exports from EU to Canada of machineries increased by 35%, of vehicles by 15%, of pharmaceutical products by 31%, of agricultural products by 15%. And CETA benefits both partners. Exports of Canada red towards the EU of minerals increased by 67%. Of machineries, they increased by 17%. And of agricultural products by 6%. 6%. 
and the relevance of CETA came to a test as COVID updated and um, appended international trade, transportation, and logistics. The pandemic affected trade around the world, and EU Canada exchanges are no different. Bilateral trade merchandise decreased by 14% in 2020 compared to 2019. But trade volumes between EU Canada started to recover at earliest June 2020. And December data almost are back, show a, a, a trade back almost to pre COVID basis. And as a result, Canada EU bilateral merchandise trades in 2020 was still 15% higher than the pre CETA level. And the positive CETA effects are even clearer when it comes to services. Bilateral trade and services grew by 30% in 2018 when compared to the pre CETA average, and by 35% in 2019. But as was mentioned earlier, this is only the beginning. CETA is a living agreement that also provides a framework for even more facilitation of our mutual exchange changes. It's a framework under which the two partners have aimed at facilitating the continuation of preferential trade during the pandemic through flexibility and additional administrative cooperation, for instance, on the verification of origin. Under the, the CETA conformity assessment protocol, the EU and Canada have agreed to accept each other's conformity assessment certificates for specific sectors. This is particularly helpful for smaller companies at the same, as the same test, they won't have to pay twice for the same test. And this will also shorten the time for entry into the market. I'm happy to confirm that we are currently finalizing the, the draft implementation guidance to assist in the full implementation of the protocol. The EU has recently recognized the Standard Council of Canada for ATEX equipment. And following this recognition, Canadian conformity assessment board bodies can get recognized for the product sectors of equipment used in explosive atmosphere, radio equipment, electrical equipment. Mark, I think, mentioned mutual recognition agreement. And indeed, CETA foresee a framework for the mutual recognition of prof professional qualification. There, there, thereby facilitating trade and services and movement of in, in business professional. I'm happy to announce that the first round of negotiations towards an MRA covering architectural architects took place this Wednesday. And the talks were very productive and we expect to pursue them at an ambitious pace. I should highlight here that the mutual recognition uh, of professional qualification agreement is based on the suggestion of the relevant professional bodies to see whether or not there is a real interest in MRAs. So Mark, I heard your interest in MRAs and I invite Canadian and European professionals to express their interest in the recognition of further professional qualifications than the architects. Another key element of CETA 
which also Mark mentioned, is the Regulatory Cooperation Forum. And we had the third meeting of the Regulatory Cooperation Forum one month ago. This forum is quite unique among the networks of FTAs the EU has with for third countries. It has been very effective in achieving concrete results on a number of files spanning a broad spectrum of activities. I would highlight again here that it's a voluntary process. The regulatory cooperation framework provides the framework, the regulatory cooperation forum provides the framework under which the sectors and their regulators can discuss a cooperation. It is not imposed. So again, I will call on the industry to call their regulators for cooperation in the sectors they are interested in. To give you a few examples of where we progress has already been made. We have worked on consumer product safety, exchanging information on the rapid alert system uh, that the EU has on products, and on the recognition of labeling of a number of cosmetic products. So CETA also provides the framework for joint analysis. And for instance, our chief economist on both sides are working on the use of the development before the use of indicators and sharing of information on assessing the impact of CETA on women-led businesses. CETA has been, uh, in 2019, accompanied by three recommendations on climate, SMEs, and gender. The collaboration between the EU and Canada on climate action is cru crucial and can make a difference on the global stage. And the CETA recommendation on climate action is a token of our joint engagement in this area. SMEs are the backbone of, our, of part, the both partners' economy. And under CETA, we have established an SME contact point to exchange SME-related information with the objective of better taking into account SME needs in the implementation of CETA. We have also developed, or sorry, not developed, but the Enterprise uh, Europe Network has established uh, into Canada. And this business, this, the network will provide business support to help connecting SMEs to develop their business on both sides of the Atlantic. And on gender, we had a roundtable two years ago hosted by Commissioner Malmstrom and Minister Carr discussing the impact of CETA on women-led businesses. But we also had this last week a webinar on gender responsive standards. So this comes into the framework of a revision of the EU trade policy. The European Commission just finalized an extensive review of its trade policy based on an 
large public uh, consultation. This review was necessary because of the context in which trade policy is operating, which has very much changed since our previous communications in 2015. So the communication for an open, sustainable and assertive trade policy is based on three key principles, openness, sustainability and assertiveness. Openness is a strategic tool choice for the EU. Trade, as I mentioned, is playing a key role in, support our, in supporting our prosperity, driving growth and making our geopolitical ambition possible. Sustainability, because this is at the core of EU policies, and you may know about the, the Green Deal presented by the European Commission in December 2019, and which is being implemented progressively now, and under the, which the, commission, the, the EU has taken groundbreaking commitments in terms of net zero carbon emission and fundamental change in its economy. So support for the Green Deal is a central pillar of our new trade policy. And assertiveness. I noted, Patrick, your comment about the, the change or the switch between developing or negotiating a, a, a trade agreement and implementing it. And indeed, the EU, with all its trade agreement, has realized that it was not enough to negotiate an agreement, but we had to implement it and to ensure that it is implemented assertively and in line with the negotiation. And that will be the core of our trade policy in the coming years. And in that form, we have set up the Chief Trade Enforcement Officer as a key instrument in this approach. So CETA is at the core of this, the commitments taken in CETA are at the core of this new trade policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Delphine, uh, for this uh, very nice presentation, not only about CETA, but also uh, about where the EU is going, especially when it comes to the trade policy review uh, and, and certainly the contributions that uh, the European Union is, is doing at, at that level. So uh, we now have about, uh, well, actually, we have half an hour, uh, a little bit less, um, for questions and answers. Uh, I would invite people to put uh, their questions or if they want to pose their questions live, uh, to put in the chat because I can't see uh, everyone. So if you raise your hand, you want to ask a question, uh, I will not see you. So I, I would I invite you to uh, to put in the chat. Um, I already I'll, I'll start off with with a few questions. One uh, and and to follow up from what Del Delphine said, and and these were issues that were all also raised by. Uh, Mark and uh, Eleonora in, in, in their presentations about kind of going forward and these major issues. And, and, and uh, Delphine, you talked about the EU's um, approach, which is based on openness, sustainability, and, and assertiveness. And, and I'd like to focus on, on the part of assertiveness. And, and we've heard the term coming out of the EU of strategic autonomy. And uh, obviously, and, and all, even in the Canadian context, uh, and we see all over the world, uh, more and more pressures, you know, to, to bring back uh, production, you know, in, uh, 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 back to Canada or back to the EU, obviously back to the United States. This has put, uh, it, this has come up, you know, the whole notion of resilience, especially in the context of the pandemic. Um, so... I, I, I'm wondering, and I think a lot of people are wondering, uh, in, in this, it, with the kinds of pressures that, that we are seeing on, on, on the policy side, 
um, how, how do you and all of you in a way from both the business and the government uh, sides uh, see, you know, the, the, you know, certainly CETA has been very positive. Um, how, how going forward can we maintain that and how can we maybe work together uh, to prevent this sort of retrenchment, right? Because there are a lot of pressures. I think Eleonora mentioned the fact that we need to tell, you know, the good story about CETA because, you know, especially for the member states who have not ratified or certain sectors or certain parts of society, they still see CETA and free trade and globalization as something very bad. Uh, so so how, how do we do this in a way together? Uh, and how can CETA be helpful for that? I don't know who, I, I mean, it's a very broad question, uh, uh, but I, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about your perspectives on, on, on these things. So maybe given that we, we, we started with Mark, maybe Mark, I'll, I'll give you a chance to, uh, to address the, the, the kind of the, in a way it's a little bit the elephant in the room that uh, we're, we're, is behind us and, and, and casting a shadow on, on you know, such good trade relations going forward. Yeah, so to give um, as sort of concise an answer as possible, I think it depends on which sector you're talking about and how CETA can be leveraged. Um, so if, if I'm talking about, you know, food security and agriculture, um, when I was talking about the non-tariff barrier issues uh, before, whether it's, you know, crop sector, whether it's meat sector, you know, to the extent that we can facilitate trade and agri-food products going in both ways, that is a way to enhance food security. We don't produce everything here domestically, uh, neither does the EU. And so how can we get, you know, mutually beneficial two-way trade to be able to feed people? Um, there are other issues, I think, as well, that are a bit more forward-looking. One of the ones that we're pressing on is critical minerals. And this is a big problem for all aspects of the supply chain, you know, whether it's the defense industry, cars, essentially, if you use a semiconductor or a chipboard, this matters to you. And so I think there is an opportunity for the two sides to come together to strengthen critical mineral supply chains. Um, a whole host of ways that you can do that, whether it's through R&D and investment incentives, uh, long-term purchasing agreements. We have a whole host of sort of ideas about how that can be done, but those are just two specific instances to, to give, and I could rattle off more uh, for the rest of the afternoon, but I'll stop there. Hey, thank you, Mark. Uh, Eleonora. Certainly, open strategic autonomy. Uh, there are a lot of questions whether the accent is on open or autonomy. <laughs> so that's that's, uh, that's a good question. And the well, you said openness, um, which is which is great for us to to hear as in business because, uh, um, as also Mark said, I mean we don't produce everything in Europe, and definitely uh, also the Finns said in our in our presentation. I mean. Uh, we are basing our trade policy on openness. We are so intertwined with uh, with other countries, so maintaining the openness is is crucial. And uh, um, so we, as citizens, we are really promoters of uh, in free trade agreement, uh, building alliances with like-minded partners like like uh, like Canada. We are definitely not thinking of uh, bringing back production. This is certainly not uh, not in some sectors we have to we have to be realistic it's not desirable it's not viable uh, but we need to be resilient so we need to come up with ways to to ensure that uh, that we can maintain openness and we need to think of all policy options that are available so um, multilateral level that's why we keep pushing for some agreements in, in some in some uh, uh, in some specific uh, policy areas that could be incredibly helpful if it's not possible at the multilateral level then again uh, we go for plurilaterals or with those that are interested in, uh, in adopting a, a, a different approach with, uh, with us um, and um, so that's that that I think that the, the, the Keywords, uh, the keywords are uh, here, and in terms of um, uh, assertiveness as well. I mean, uh, it's uh, we need to we need to realize that uh, um, we have to enforce rules when, when we have them. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it, it's part of the implementation. So we need as well to uh, to bring uh, to, to bring about the instruments that allow us. To enforce rules when we when we have them and make sure that uh, that there is compliance with these rules. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Eleonora. And, and, and so if I can sum up in a way the, the, the business perspective here, uh, it is we, we, we believe in openness, we want to continue trading, we want to trade more, we want to do more business. And uh, at the same time, obviously, let's find ways to cooperate uh, in order to deal, as, as Mark mentioned, you know, increase food security, achieve, in a way, uh, public policy objectives, whether it's critical minerals, food security, the environment, climate change, uh, as opposed to just say, well, let's all try to do it on our own and close our borders to each other. Uh, so that, that, that certainly uh, seems to be the, the message. Uh, Geneviève. Um... I wish my, my colleague uh, from uh, the GEO would be there, but I can tell you that we've been um, supporting our missions and especially uh, our, our, our mission in Brew uh, under uh, Dr. Ailish to uh, engage in um, surveys uh, and, and advocacy initiatives uh, throughout Europe. And we did it also for uh, recently in Italy. So uh, we're looking at an advocacy uh, ongoing campaign um, that started last year. So that's all I can say uh, for that, <laughs> for now. But, uh, thank you, Geneviève. I, I think it's great. Again, it shows how, uh, you know, it, it seems that having an agreement uh, like CETA, uh, having, in a way, what ultimately is, is a, 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 a long-standing cooperation, which started even before the agreement came into place, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the negotiations, because of everyone in a way getting together, whether it's the business, the negotiators, and then with the agreement, working towards uh, making the most of, of this agreement and, and this partnership. And let's, let's not forget the strategic partnership, which uh, Ailish Campbell mentioned uh, this morning. Uh, so I think, again, uh, from what Genevieve just said, I think it, it really shows how, you know, building from the agreement, we can also work on other issues that ultimately are linked uh, to, to, to trade and investment and, and economic uh, benefits, but also for kind of greater social purposes. Uh, so so that, that, that's great news to hear. Delphine, please. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and I think um, the um, EU communica the communication on the new trade policy is exactly along the line of what your, the two business representatives uh, have highlighted. Um, strategic autonomy is not protectionism, not at all. Uh, it is not uh, bringing production back uh, home uh, as a principle. It is, it is in fact promoting diversification of supply chain. It is ensuring trade is rule-based. And I heard Eleonora stressing the importance of rules in trade. And there, the EU and Canada are working very closely uh, in, on the reform of uh, the WTO on addressing uh, the stalemate at the, uh, on the, uh, regarding the appellate body. Uh, we are uh, working in the framework of the Ottawa group uh, set up by uh, Canada, uh, but in the WTO uh, meetings uh, more generally, very, very closely hand in hand. Um, because we are, partners that are both have economies that are based on trade, that are very open economies, and that believe uh, that uh, trade must be carried in compliance with rules to ensure that we are not uh, coerced by a third country, which we may have experienced recently. Um, and, by, and in this respect, for instance, the EU uh, will pro propose uh, an instrument uh, to pro protect its uh, companies from coercive action by uh, third countries. So yes, strategic autonomy is the opposite of protectionism. It is ensuring that open trade is carried out for the benefit of all. 
Okay, thank you. This was this is a useful clarification because uh, I, I I mean certainly in, in the press often the notion of strategic autonomy uh, has been presented as as you know turning inwards and and basically blocking uh, trade from um, from the outside and uh, and obviously with fears of protectionism uh, certainly and and maybe in a way the the, the, the U.S. policy trade policy up until recently, although still going, going, uh, as cast kind of uh, helped the, the narrative going in a certain way and like, oh, you hear about autonomy, then uh, it's all about, uh, you know, protectionism and, 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 and bringing production back. So I'll go to questions from, uh, we uh, now have about 15 minutes, so I'll go to questions from, from the audience, if that's okay. And then uh, two ambassadors who have uh, addressed us, who are addressing us uh, today, uh, are also um, uh, students, uh, academics of, of international relations. Uh, so also uh, Dr. Campbell. Uh, so Ambassador Gabrich, um, before becoming uh, the uh, ambassador designate uh, of the EU to Canada, was uh, the uh, Slovenian ambassador uh, to Canada. So in a way, uh, you can see the EU is, is, is very efficient in, in, their, in their approach. Right, uh, they have someone from a member state, and they just say, "Okay, you're just going to move uh, to an another embassy as opposed to moving to to another country." Uh, and and that's obviously because of the close coordination of uh, the uh, external action service um, of the European Union. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Gabrich holds a PhD in inter international relations uh, from Slovenia, uh, and she has worked uh, on bilateral and multilateral international relations. Uh, before coming to Canada, she was the Director of Development Cooperation and Humanitarian Aid in, in, for the Slovenian government. Uh, prior to that posting, uh, she was a Senior Advisor on Human Rights uh, to two Presidents of the United Nations General Assembly in New York. So uh, a lot of experience at the UN. Uh, she was also a Diplomatic Advisor to the President and Prime Minister of Slovenia uh, and uh, also was the Slovenian Consul General in New York. So Dr. Grabich, uh, we're uh, very happy to have you with us to give you the opportunity in a way to, to wrap up uh, what has been uh, a great conference. Uh, and uh, so I now turn the screen to you. Yes, hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is a, a great pleasure for me to be with you today. Uh, uh, of course, I would be even uh, happier to be with you in the same place, but uh, uh, I would like to thank the University of Ottawa uh, and Carleton University uh, for your resilience uh, to keep this uh, yearly get together going despite everything. Uh, and uh, I would like to say that uh, we are very pleased uh, to be part of this important reflection uh, and I can assure you that also from our side, uh, we have been working very hard uh, to contribute to our shared prosperity and recovery, uh, also through the promotion and implementation of CEPA. Uh, here, I want to thank uh, our Canadian friends uh, for the excellent and ongoing cooperation uh, that we have been enjoying all along. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, in particular, also like to acknowledge uh, my colleague, uh, Elish Campbell, uh, with whom we have uh, excellent cooperation, uh, and I'm much looking forward to our continued cooperation. Um, today's meeting, it really is uh, an important meeting, and uh, I would say what uh, uh, Professor Lebrun just said, uh, it is really important to see uh, different perspectives, the academic, uh, the institutional, uh, also uh, more business uh, uh, related or uh, business uh, uh, perspective. Uh, and, uh, you know, it allows us uh, it, uh, to reflect jointly on uh, where we stand in trade relations between Canada and the EU, uh, thanks uh, to CETA. Uh, and um, uh, how uh, significant this agreement has been for our business community, our consumers, our citizens uh, at large, but also uh, for expanding our policy uh, and political relations. Um, 
today's event uh, hosted by the Jean Monnet uh, Center uh, of Carleton University and the uh, CN Tellier Chair at U Ottawa U uh, allowed us to bring the two perspective together, perspectives together. This is much uh, appreciated um, to see both the policy and the political aspects uh, uh, on the one hand and the business dimension and opportunities it fosters uh, for different stakeholders on the other. Uh, I would also like to congratulate the, the organizers of this conference uh, for your perfect timing. Uh, one could even say uh, for your prescience uh, as today's event follows on the hills of yesterday's uh, CETA uh, Joint Committee, uh, the second ministerial meeting that took place uh, under the joint chairship uh, of the European Commission uh, Executive President, Valdis uh, Dombrovskis, and the Canadian Minister of International Trade, uh, Mary Ang. Uh, well, they took stock of progress on CETA implementation and agreed on the path forward. Uh, if you'd allow me, I'll, I'll first say a few words uh, about the wider priorities in our EU-Canada relations and also uh, then uh, try to talk a little bit to how CETA helps promote the, these shared priorities. Uh, this year, we are marking 45 years since the European Union opened its diplomatic representation in Ottawa. And uh, in this time span of almost a half century, we developed a strong strategic and economic partnership and establish good cooperation on a whole range of issues. Uh, we are important trading partners uh, with 72 billion euros, 1 trillion Canadian uh, uh, dollars of trading goods annually. And the EU is Canada's second biggest trading uh, partner after the US. Well, the most immediate priority and the challenge that we all face uh, is uh, of course COVID-19 where I am pleased to note that we have had a very good cooperation. Uh, the EU has been supporting Canada by supplying vaccines uh, made uh, by manufacturers uh, in the EU. Actually, 90% of all vaccines that reach Canada so far uh, came from the EU. And uh, we are also working closely together uh, uh, through the Global Vaccine Facility, COEX. Uh, another big priority that the EU and Canada share is action on climate change and biodiversity. Uh, we are, as uh, we all know, both committed to be carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, and uh, we have a range of strong and fr fruitful dialogues and uh, energy, climate, the environment. And uh, as was mentioned uh, several times earlier, uh, we also uh, have uh, cooperation on critical raw materials and minerals. Uh, let me also mention that we are, uh, for example, uh, closely coordinating our policies ahead of the uh, COP26 uh, conference in Glasgow this fall. Uh, the issue of digital governance is another salient era of, uh, area of cooperation where we see eye to eye on many issues linked to the digital transformation of our societies and uh, uh, address issue, issues such as regulation uh, with regard to accountability of digital pl platforms uh, through our uh, ICT uh, dialogue. Uh, and uh, uh, it was also mentioned several times, we work together uh, on the responsible use of uh, AI all very important uh, uh, issues. And uh, of course, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention uh, another uh, priority area, which is uh, we are working together to preserve and reform the multilateral order. Uh, well, both the EU and Canada, a democracy based on the rule of law, uh, we are like-minded countries uh, and uh, we work together to support human rights, the rule of law, gender equality, democracy. And of course, uh, we also uh, work together on rules-based governance uh, uh, in um, 
trade, for example, uh, through uh, reforming the WTO as an example, and we much appreciate uh, our cooperation in the Ottawa group. So our overall relationship is underpinned by two important agreements. The Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement, CETA, that provides the framework for our economic relationship and the Strategic Partnership Agreement, uh, both uh, came into effect or provisional effect around the same time. And the Strategic Partnership Agreement provides a platform uh, for um, strategic or cooperation in uh, international peace, security, human rights, environmental protection, research and innovation, energy, uh, security, and so forth. So uh, let me first outline how CETA uh, helps uh, support uh, our common priorities. Um, let me underline what was uh, noted before, uh, but it is worth uh, repeating. CETA is one of the most, if not the most progressive agreement the EU has ever concluded. Uh, it has some of the strongest commitments, uh, commitments uh, ever included in a trade deal to promote labor rights, environmental protection, sustainable development. Um, and um, I would also say that uh, CETA provides a useful framework for a green transition and a more sustainable growth model. Uh, our trade policies uh, should, of course, contribute to our goals on uh, sustainable development and uh, climate, change, climate action. Um, here, we are um, working closely with Canada uh, to foster transatlantic partnerships in different areas of greening our economies, including in the use of new technologies and new ways of doing business uh, that are sustainable. Um, so uh, I believe uh, Professor Lebrun ask, uh, uh, was just uh, referring to uh, how, uh, you know, CETA can help with greening, uh, how uh, in speci specific terms it can help. And uh, I would like to give you a specific set example of how uh, CETA actually uh, can and does contribute to greening our economies. Um, so trade in environmental goods between the EU and Canada, uh, such as energy efficient machinery or measuring equipment for pollution levels has been steadily increasing and trade in environmental goods was actually uh, barely, if at all, impacted by the pandemic. Uh, so if I now uh, say a few words about uh, effects of CETA, of course, we all know CETA is a young uh, agreement, only three and a half years old. Uh, it has already delivered tangible benefits to European and Canadian stakeholders alike. Um, and of course, the relevance of the CETA came to a test as COVID uh, severely affected international trade, uh, transportation and logistics. While at first uh, hard hit, um, trade volumes between the EU and Canada uh, started to reco recover as early as June 2020, uh, with December data almost back to pre-COVID levels. Uh, this uh, demonstrates uh, quite clearly that the 5,000 new European firms that became active on the Canadian mar market after CETA and the 500 new Canadian firms on the EU market uh, continue to be served by the agreement that has made them uh, competitive on each other's markets uh, despite the COVID crisis uh, and uh, all the logistic uh, challenges it created. Uh, well, I, I would like to point out that even last year uh, when COVID had an unprecedented impact on worldwide trade uh, exchanges between the EU and Canada, uh, though declining, were still 15% higher than pre-CETA. Uh, and uh, I would say this is a sign of the resi uh, resi uh, resilience of our economies and a, a good starting point for economic recovery, which we hope will be, well, swift and sustained. Uh, we are not uh, under the illusion that it will be easy, but uh, uh, we have a very good framework within which uh, to 
uh, strive for uh, such a swift and sustained, uh, sustained uh, recovery. Uh, well, if uh, this is basically to say that, uh, you know, the CETA actually uh, fosters uh, trade diversification uh, and uh, also creates strong links and value chains between uh, our trading communities. And this way, uh, it is making our bilateral trade more resilient to the pandemic. Uh, let me uh, emphasize that CETA is particularly geared to help uh, SMEs. Uh, small companies are the backbone of both of our economies are, and are also the category that was most affected by the crisis. Uh, so it is all uh, the more important that CETA allows uh, for simplified custom procedures, more compatible technical requirements, um, avoidance of double testing in a number of sectors, uh, and uh, also that it helps, uh, uh, especially important for SMEs, better access to information uh, about uh, market opportunities. All this should help SMEs on the path of post-COVID recovery. And uh, as has been emphasized, the, the trade and gender is another important aspect that we want to jointly promote in the CETA framework. And let me mention that earlier this year, no, well, yes, this year, but also this month, uh, actually it was uh, in March, experts from the EU, Canada, uh, and uh, several international standards organizations led an online reflection workshop uh, on the importance of gender responsive standards. Uh, let me also uh, reiterate um, or bring to your attention, uh, Delphine just mentioned it, uh, that next week uh, we will organize uh, together with our Canadian friends, the EU Canada workshop on CETA opportunities for the clean technology sector. Um, Another example of how uh, CETA can uh, contribute uh, to uh, greening our economies. Uh, the event will be opened by a European Commissioner for Environment, Sincretius, and Canadian Minister of Environment uh, and Climate Change, uh, Wilkinson, uh, with the participation of the Trade Minister, Hank. Uh, and uh, as uh, I believe uh, Delphine mentioned, uh, we will have over 500 European and Canadian companies uh, participating and uh, they will have uh, an opportunity to identify uh, uh, green uh, opportunities on the other partners market uh, to you know, leverage CETA and uh, to contribute uh, also to meeting both government's green targets. Um, in conclusion, uh, let me observe that the context in which uh, trade policy is operating uh, has changed very much since the EU's last strategy was undertook in 2015. Uh, we have seen a deepening of crisis of multilateralism, protectionism has increased, uh, and the COVID uh, pandemic uh, has highlighted the need to monitor uh, critical supply chain, chains, uh, keep them open and disrupted, uh, and of course, ensure fair and equitable access to critical goods. Um, the new European trade policy strategy called for uh, an open, sustainable, and assertive trade policy uh, was published a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and it takes all these aspect, aspects into consideration and envisages the path for EU's recovery from uh, the pandemic. Uh, it charged a path towards realizing our overall priorities that we actually share uh, with Canada, that is the twin green and digital transitions. I feel privileged uh, to work with the EU and Canadian uh, trade and academic communities so we can write together the blank pages of CETA implementation and contribute together to open trade and the values and goals that we share. Uh, so with this, uh, I now look forward to questions uh, and um, would be very happy to engage uh, and uh, answer any questions you may have. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Gabrich. Um, I have one question, and, and we don't have much time. Unfortunately, we, we, we are going to end at, at one o'clock um, as, as planned. But certainly, I, I think this is a question that's probably on, on a lot of people's minds uh, right now is the uh, certainly the, the debate and, and, and discussions that have been going on in the European Union about um, vaccine exports. You, you did mention that uh, the large majority, if, if not almost all vaccines that came to Canada have come, have been produced in the European Union. And certainly, we, we are very thankful for that and, and look forward to more. But we know that there's been a, a great debate about export restrictions, right? About uh, ensuring that vaccines uh, produced in Europe will go first and foremost uh, to the European, European citizens and then the rest of the world, a little bit as we've seen in the United States. That has been their policy. And then we see that there are pressures and there have been, uh, uh, there's been a, a, a reinforcement at least of the framework for doing so in Europe. So from a Canadian perspective, we are a little bit worried. Does that mean that we, we, we should expect uh, restrictions and, and controls on those vaccines that technically have been promised to Canadians? Yes, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, it is obviously a, a very much uh, at the forefront of our agenda. Uh, now, I would like to say, uh, if you'll allow me just to give you a little bit of a uh, context here. Um, well, the EU responded to COVID crisis with solidarity. Uh, and that uh, uh, is true both uh, within the bloc and beyond its borders. Uh, as you know, we have a common vaccine strategy that allows all member states uh, to get vaccines uh, equitably uh, at whatever pace is currently possible. Uh, and uh, I can uh, confirm, uh, it was confirmed today that Europe has been a number one exporter of vaccines. Uh, uh, and uh, that means uh, I think, I'm not sure uh, about the numbers, so I'm not going to use them, but uh, if I uh, um, understood this correctly, we had a debrief from yesterday's uh, European Council meeting. Uh, it is about uh, the same number of uh, vaccines that were produced in Europe uh, were used uh, within the bloc uh, and the same uh, uh, proportion, the same number was exported. We exported about 41 million vaccine doses to 33 uh, countries uh, since early uh, February and counting. Uh, Canada uh, received 5.6 million doses so far. And uh, yesterday, another million 90,000, to give you the exact number, was, uh, uh, was given authorization uh, for the export. Uh, so, uh, of course, the uh, export authorization mechanism uh, is not a ban, as uh, it is obviously uh, evident from uh, the numbers I just uh, uh, just uh, uh, quoted uh, uh, on the export side. Uh, but uh, the idea and the purpose of this uh, uh, mechanism is to uh, in, insert some transparency. Uh, in the export and um, of vaccines, and it is really uh, geared towards the companies uh, that do not uh, live up to their commitments. Uh, and uh, this is to say um, to their contractual commitments. Uh, we saw that uh, this particular producer, uh, you know, they didn't, uh, AstraZeneca, they didn't even reach 30% of their uh, contractual uh, commitments uh, to the European countries while they were, uh, you know, uh, exporting uh, large uh, numbers of uh, uh, doses. Uh, so it's really, uh, it's really, uh, uh, you know, uh, geared towards uh, ensuring that uh, that uh, the obligations are in, are uh, respected. Uh, and if there are delays, if there are shortages in production, that these shortages and delays are shared equitably, so that partners share, uh, you know, these uh, uh, the, the drawbacks of uh, the uh, slow rollout, let's say. Uh, so that all to say, well, you know that we've been uh, now referring to the uh, 
to the two principles of reciprocity and of proportionality. Um, and uh, when it comes to reciprocity, of course, uh, uh, that uh, refers to those countries that have their own productions. Uh, and uh, when it comes to proportionality, that refers to the level of uh, vaccination, the vaccination rates in the uh, countries of export, meaning if the, a country of export uh, is in much better shape than the European Union, then uh, you know the member state uh, that is uh, uh, actually exporting should take that into consideration. I think this is a, a very fair and kind of reasonable approach. Uh, you have to understand that uh, uh, while there is a concern and anxiety around their rollouts uh, here in Canada, the same is uh, in Europe, we have uh, similar levels of uh, vaccination. And uh, as I said before, uh, I mean, you know, we, we, are, we are actually happy that uh, we could uh, actually provide the vast majority of uh, vaccines that have uh, been admi administered uh, so far in Canada. And one more last thing I would say is that uh, our uh, leaders really do encourage uh, companies to live up to their commitments, uh, both to the EU countries, but also to our partners um, like Canada. Uh, so yeah, so on this, I would just uh, uh, you know, like to uh, conclude also that uh, we have a very uh, close relationship and our leaders, our ministers uh, have been in regular contact. Thank you very much for this uh, very detailed and, and very clear uh, clarification of the EU's position uh, when it comes to um, uh, vaccine authorizations for, for export. And, and certainly we understand uh, that that the EU, you know, that there has to be some kind of burden sharing, obviously, uh, since this is a worldwide pandemic, and 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 we do there has to be solidarity uh, at this. So thank you very much for for taking the time to to explain this. Uh, so this is, in fact, all the time that we have. Uh, it's quite incredible how fast it has gone, uh, which means that it was a great conference. Uh, when you don't see the time happening uh, going forward. So thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Gabrich, uh, for, for closing this, this conference, for um, being with us. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, attending this conference. Uh, we hope that it has been uh, valuable, useful uh, to you, that you have learned from it. Uh, and uh, in closing, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers. So Kathleen Schmidt, Lily Tjopchenkova, uh, Krina Viju uh, uh, for uh, making this possible. Uh, thank you to the panelists uh, for not only accepting our invitation, but coming here and, and, and sharing your, your, your thoughts, your knowledge. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you also to the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at Carleton University and the Center for European Studies. Uh, for hosting uh, this conference and the, 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 the faculty of, of public affairs at Carleton as part of the, their research series. So this conference was taking place there. Uh, obviously, uh, the, 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 the European Commission contributes to uh, a lot of the great work that we do. So thank you as part of their Jean Monnet grants. Uh, and uh, also thank you to the CN Tellier chair of which I am the, the holder. Uh, for also uh, helping to uh, organize this conference. So thank you very much. Uh, for those of you, uh, please go and share. There will be, the, the recordings will be available. There will also be a written summary uh, posted on the uh, Center for European Studies website uh, in, in the weeks coming. Uh, so uh, look forward to that if, if, if you want to, you know, get the, the, the quick and dirty of, of, of what was said. Uh, and uh, I wish everyone, uh, as we say in French, uh, bonne continuation, uh, stay well, stay healthy, and hopefully we will all be vaccinated soon enough so that we can all meet together again very soon. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, all the best. And uh, let's, let's keep up the good narrative so we, we keep you know, uh, doing business with each other in cooperation. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone.